Good morning, everyone, and welcome back. Uh, I really hope you enjoyed Helsinki to its fullest yesterday. Uh, it was a beautiful evening. Um, and uh, I also hope that you have slept well and got some coffee. Uh, now, we, today, we're going to have three sessions. Um, we're going to have three sessions, and then we're going to go for uh, lunch a little bit later, but still uh, lunch. And the first session is um, Alternative Data and Data Mining as a Source for New Insight. The second uh, session will be New Trends Shaping Financial Services. And the third uh, session today will be Future of Financial Stability. So today we're going to look uh, a little bit more towards the future. Um, but we will start with Alternative Data and Data Mining. There is a growing number of new sources available today. Data sets such as sensor data, microtransaction data, complemented with new methods for data mining are opening up new ways to analyze and understand financial markets. And the first speaker um, is uh, Edgar May, and I'm really hoping I'm pronouncing it some, somehow right. Edgar May is the uh, head of AI discovery team in Bloomberg Engineering. Um, so he's the head of Bloomberg's artificial intelligence discovery team. Uh, he leads several groups of researchers and engineers that work on graph analytics, question answering, and smart contextual suggestion with uh, severe latency constraints. Um, he has done a lot of work in this group, and I think he's going to talk more about that himself. Uh, he's a senior scientist with a background in artificial intelligence, information retrieval, NLP, machine learning, large-scale computing, infrastructures, knowledge graphs, and semantic search. He has more than 110 publications and more than 2,000 citations, and um, he has also been active in several top conferences. He holds a PhD uh, in computer science from the University of Amsterdam and um, uh, have a extensive track in knowledge graphs and information retrieval and some other fields that he's also going to talk about. So uh, please, thank you for coming here, and the floor is yours. Thank you. <coughs> Thanks for that very lengthy and very um, <laughs> worthy introduction. Um, yeah, so my name is Edgar May. You did pronounce it correctly. Uh, I am Dutch, in case you hadn't noticed. Um, I'm also very much a computer scientist by training. I hold a PhD um, in computer science from the University of Amsterdam. Um, <clears throat> I think a shorter summary would have been, um, I've been doing big data for a long time, right? I worked at Yahoo before I was at Bloomberg. And there, we're doing web search um, well, at big data scale before it was even called big data. So I think it's a nice um, way of sort of diving into things. Um, right now, I work at Bloomberg. Indeed, I uh, lead the AI discovery efforts. Um, and I'm going to be talking a little bit today about uh, AI and how we use artificial intelligence um, to understand news. Like, I'm going to make a point that actually news and textual documents in general, so like um, including tweets, for instance, or blog posts and all those things, um, have the potential to unlock quite a bit of financial signals um, that I will show you later on. Um, let me see if this works. It does. Has anyone in the room ever seen this before? Let me see a show of hands. This is a, um, a system that was developed by the Sumerians a few thousand years before Christ. Um, as they were scaling up their agricultural activities, they had to have like shared storage for, for instance, grain and other kinds of resources. The way they kept track of what they put in there was by using these clay tablets that you see here at the bottom. Um, they put those clay tablets in these bowls that you see in the back. They're called bulas. <coughs> and the way they made sure that the contents were what people agreed upon, they impressed a seal into the bola uh, to make sure that everyone signed off and that there was trust, really, uh, with this transaction. Um, I'm going to skip over this one. Um, so fast forward a few years later. Uh, <laughs> Um, I'm sure everyone here in the room has knows, knows what this is. Um, this is one of the first keyboards of the Bloomberg terminal from the Bloomberg Professional Service. Um, and it really sort of marked a shift in the financial markets, I think, in the financial world in general. Um, fast forward even more to like recent years, and you'll see um, the modern version of the Bloomberg terminal. This is actually a screenshot from, um, uh, from a TV series, a comedy series. Uh, it's called Billionaire. It's about like evil hedge fund managers and they're trying to take over the world. And of course, the Bloomberg terminal features prominently in, prominently in there. Um, in case you don't know, so Bloomberg, the company, uh, typically has like three arms we would like to think of. Um, on the one hand side, we do a lot with data, obviously. We ingest data from all over the world, from all sorts of places, uh, including conventional sources, such as company filings, 
but also more old data. Indeed, like was already mentioned, we do stuff with, um, for instance, foot traffic in, in malls or like commercial aviation flights that we track. Um, the second piece, the second leg, if you will, of Bloomberg is the analytics piece. So where you can come to the Bloomberg terminal uh, and use it to, to get insights, to find analyses, correlations, or even just trade. Um, and the third leg that is basically maybe not the most commonly known one uh, is, is communications. And by this, we really mean um, the entire sort of social ecosystem that is around, that sort of uh, is embedded within the terminal. Right? You can use the terminal to send emails, but there's also an instant messaging client in there. Uh, and our clients, actually, our clients actively use this to, um, well, uh, to make trades, for instance, but to do over-the-counter trading with each other, um, to find price quotes, or just to chat and hang out uh, in, in chat rooms. Um, fast forward a little bit more, even, um, and I don't think it should come as a surprise to anyone here that we are now in what we call an AI revolution, right? Uh, AI is all over. Um, and something kind of remarkable happened, I think, in the last five years, um, because all these AI technologies and techniques um, really have made a significant change in society. And well, these headlines are just a small sample of things that, uh, that are happening. If you think about it, like, for instance, the things that have happened, there have been um, market increases in certain technological advances, for instance, how to um, learn cars, how to drive on their own, to de detect images, to detect, like, within pictures, to detect figures or concepts, like cats and so on. Um, and this really came into being, I would say, because of two main things. Um, the first thing that happened was the techniques that are typically used are, are deep learning. I'm not going to, I can spend the whole hours talking about deep learning. I won't. Um, but the point there is that deep learning has been around for quite some time. The point is that only recently we've been able to do this at scale uh, with modern computing architectures. Now, why did this all suddenly take off? It has to do with the video cards and games, sorry, in, in machines, that if you have any kids, like they have in their own like desktop machines, they use to play video games. Those video cards are the exact same cards that allow us to do deep learning at scale and to actually develop self-driving cars. So there was sort of a, I don't know, uh, those things basically progressed in tandem, I, I should say. The second thing that happened is there is a sort of delusion data. And, and by this, I mean all sorts of data. Um, oh, yeah, this is, by the way, just to drive home the point that this is the amount of mentions of um, artificial intelligence in, in earnings call transcripts, mind you. Not just like in tweets, but like actually people in earnings call transcripts talking about artificial intelligence. Um, <clears throat> the second thing I want to drive home is the fact that we are increasingly dealing with, um, uh, we have more and more data. And, and the companies, I think we've seen some examples here from, from Amazon and Microsoft yesterday. Um, these companies are, are gathering data about us and from us in, at increasing scales. A very trivial example, if you think about it, I mentioned the example of doing concept detection in images, right? I give you a picture and you tell me if it contains a, a cat or not. Um, you've probably all seen, like, and whenever you log into a website, you type in your username, you type in your password, and you get this sort of pop-up, right? That needs, you need to prove that you're not a robot. You've probably seen that one. Now, this is basically a grid with images, right? You need to select the ones that contain, like, a, a bike or a traffic sign or something like this. Um, more often than not, you actually get to see two of these. And you might wonder why. Well, the thing is, for the first one, they actually test if whether or not you are a robot, right? They actually, like, they know the right answers to see if you click on it. The second one, um, they don't actually know which pictures contain the actual bike, right? The system is actually owned by Google, and Google uses it to improve their bike detection algorithms and images. So we are at scale delivering training data for their algorithms. Um, so yeah, just I, I, I put some uh, some buzzwords on here. So we have data science uh, that might be familiar to most of you uh, that really deals with using scientific methods and algorithms to extract knowledge and insights, either from structured data or unstructured data. AI, on the other hand, deals more with like emulating human cognition, like to think how we do and to solve tasks like we can. Um, and one thing to note here also that's interesting, maybe, um, is the fact that AI is ever elusive, right? This is Tesla's theorem that says AI is a thing that's like, it's always on the horizon. It's always like just out of reach. If you think about it, a few years ago, it was like true AI would be to do optical character recognition, right? I give you a PDF, and you'll be able to recognize that it's an A, and that's an E, and it's another kind of character. Right now, we can do that. We can actually do like, understanding of images and PDFs at scale uh, with very high precision. Um, so that's no longer AI, right? We, we keep on moving on and on and on and on. Um, and then, of course, there's machine learning here, ML, in the mix, um, which I would say is a subset of AI. You need machine learning using data to do artificial intelligence. All right, now, back to my point. So um, what you see here is a visual depiction of, um, of messages being exchanged um, 
specifically within stock exchanges, between stock exchanges, people making trades. There's some spikes in here, right? You see financial crisis, flash crash. There's some like um, actual sort of natural disasters in, in there. Um, there's some downgrades, some, uh, some macroeconomic events. Um, on average, we ingest, within Bloomberg, we ingest 2 million news stories. We produce and ingest 2 million news stories per day. Um, so there really is a signal in, in news, and if, especially if you correlate it with things like volatility or, uh, or pricing. Well, there's a misalignment here. So what you see here is a plot of the, uh, the stock price of a big American investment bank. Uh, this happened some time ago. Um, where at some point the SEC announced that they, would like, they, would, they were going to investigate this investment bank. Right? Uh, so they pushed out the story, the SEC did, uh, and the Bloomberg picked it up automatically, and we parsed out the text automatically. I'll get back to this in a little bit. Um, and then you already see like, people picking up on the story and, and starting to sell, uh, chasing their position. Um, a few, the order is like minutes on the x-axis here, so within a few minutes the New York Times broke the story. Um, and before you like, before like three, four minutes have passed, uh, the stock has lost like 12% of its, of its value. The point of this, of course, is you want to write this wave early, first and foremost. If you're a trader, you want to care, you care about this, right? You want to sell, uh, not that it's all percent loss. Um, but secondly, it also proves um, the effects that news or news stories or text can actually have on, on financial markets. Um, here's another example. This is um, the stock price of Manwa Holdings, a Hong Kong-based uh, holding company. Here, what happened was there's um, Muddy Waters. I'm not sure if anyone knows this. It's, like, uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a hedge fund. Um, Carson, I don't know his last name, actually. He was at a conference in New York City, and there he announced that he was going short on this company because he, because he thought there were all signs of like, uh, suspicious activities happening around this company. Nothing was ever investigated. He was just announcing that he was going to go short. Um, and before you know it, the, the stock lost a significant chunk of its value. Um, you can actually drill down, you can zoom in a little bit more, right? So I, I put the headlines down there uh, that appeared around that same time. If you zoom in a bit more even, you actually see people who are in the room in New York City uh, listening in on a conference and tweeting about what is, being, what is happening, right? So they're picking up on this story. Um, people are basically announcing that this famous short, short seller has set his sights on this model holdings, and people are trading on this information already. All right. <coughs> Um, no, I'm going to skip over this one. So what we need to do in order to like, make, distill, if you will, these textual documents or tweets or company filings or news stories into tradable signals, we need to identify um, what they're about. Right? So what are the entities, what are the companies that I mentioned, who are the people that are involved, uh, are they credible, which is also something I will touch on. Um, so for today's end, we have a whole, like, I would say, a car wash of, of the steps that we take. We uh, take as input uh, a news story, then we extract certain entities out of those things. We build a network out of the things that are mentioned in, in, in the news story, and then we push it out. And I'll be touching on all those points uh, in the rest of my presentation. Um, yeah, so what I said, like a car wash, right? The new stuff comes in, either a, tech, uh, either a tweet or a company filing or a news story or something else. We extract things from those tweets or from those news stories and from those things. We interpret it and then we present it. Um, and I'll be touching a little bit about this uh, on this later on. Now, um, I'm not sure if everyone here is aware, we have like two, maybe 3,000 journalists employed at Bloomberg. Uh, so we are an active producer of news content, as most of you probably know. We're also an aggregator of news. So we take on board news from all over. From, I mentioned Twitter already, but also things like SEC filings. But we also take in news wires such as the New York Times, the Dow Jones. All those sources are being sucked up into the Bloomberg ecosystem. Um, and we extract the same kinds of entities on all those different data sources. Um, so it looks a little bit something like this. It's an animated GIF. Uh, it just shows news flying in. Um, on average, we have a, a whole lot more news stories coming in than just this, but just to give you an idea of um, what's coming in. And of course, one thing that we are um, proactively dealing with is credibility. So what you see here is a picture of, well, actually, the bottom picture is the true one, and the one at the top has been redacted. Someone has turned the the whale that sort of landed on a beach into a giant squid. It was all over the news, of course, because a giant squid had landed on the beach. Uh, of course, this didn't happen. Um, and we have various safeguards in place. So for instance, uh, this kind of thing especially happens on Twitter, of course, right? People post a lot of like, noise on there. Um, so we have, uh, we have humans in the loop to occasionally check for things and make sure that we don't um, well, ingest weird things. Let's keep it that way. 
Um, and we also have, uh, the, what we do for Twitter basically is we also have, uh, perform heavy whitelisting. So we have a, uh, a small curated set of Twitter handles that we know, that we trust, and uh, we only ingest those sources. Um, and again, this is curated. So if ever someone wants to have more Twitter handles added, they need to be uh, curated by human beings. Um, we also do a lot of research in this space. Um, if you're interested in this sort of thing, there's some references at the bottom. And what you see here is a tweet from someone who is announcing there's a fire uh, in the Trump Tower in New York City. Well, the geolocation of his phone actually says that he is in England at the, at the time. So this is kind of a simple things that we can also leverage to uh, have a, a gauge on credibility. Um, here's another example. I'm not sure um, how many people here remember this explosion in the White House that, that sort of injured Barack Obama. I, I hope no one did, uh, because it didn't actually happen. Um, what did happen was the Associated Press Twitter account got hacked, uh, and they put out this tweet. Of course, because it is the Associated Press, it is a verified account. We also put it into our systems. Uh, it was sort of hacked at the source, if you will. But people jumped on this, of course, right? So there must have been some automated training happening also. But within a matter of like minutes, um, like the S&P 500 that you see up there uh, lost about 136 billion uh, of its value. It recovered quickly, but still, these are heavy shocks, I would say. All right. I'm doing on time. Okay. Um, so just to give you a feel of other kind of things that we do, um, so these are typical documents that you might find in press releases or in company filings. And what we do here is we automatically extract data from these things, right? These are PDFs. So for human beings, it's quite easy to parse this, to understand this, to see where the data points are and what the data points sort of mean. For a machine, this is, this is super hard to do. First of all, you need to figure out where the tables are, and you need to figure out the values, you need to do this optical character recognition that I mentioned earlier. Um, so if you take an example like, like these two, um, First, you need to figure out where all the interesting tidbits are in the PDF. You need to extract them. Um, and then the next thing you also need to do is actually correlate these with existing values that you may or may not have. Um, of course, you need to do this in multiple languages because the world's not the entire world speaks English, even though we sometimes like to think so. Um, and of course, we also need to, um, need to contextualize things. So what you see here on the right-hand side uh, is a screenshot from the Bloomberg Terminal. This has to do with Starbucks, um, uh, key financial insights financial analyses. And the thing is that there might be a misalignment between what's reported in the company filing and the way we report things. So one could be, for instance, like a 12-month rolling average, where the other is like a six-month rolling average. So you need to do some understanding what the data actually means there also. Now, again, coming from a computer science background, the, machine, the machinery and the techniques and the technology um, for detecting images, like I said earlier, is exactly the same. Right? In this case, we're not detecting cats, but we're detecting tables, and we're detecting data values in those tables. Again, the machinery is the exact same thing, just trained on different data and a different scale. One thing to note also is that at Bloomberg, we've been doing this manually for quite some time. So we have an insane amount of training data available to us that we can use to train these models with um, and to improve them going forward, of course, also. Another interesting sort of recent development that we're looking at is also how to parse graphs. So this is a scatter plot, and, and we built an open source framework that takes a graph and tries to like turn it into a table. What was the source uh, data that fed into the table that generated this particular uh, graph? It's called Scatteract. It's open source. You can have a look if you're interested. Um, all right. Interpretation. So. There are different ways of presenting this kind of information. Yeah. Um, like one way would be indeed to alert um, for things, right? You push on alert to people like something is happening with the S&P 500, something's happening here, something's happening there. You could do it retroactively like you see here. So we can like figure out sentiments and see how this uh, has played out in the past. I would also like to touch on a different kind of uh, interpretation scenario. So Larry asked me to talk a little bit about knowledge graphs, um, which is one thing we're developing within Bloomberg. And knowledge graphs are a way to piece together, to connect together different types of data, right? Think, imagine you have a, like a, a company data set, a company database, you have a people database, you have an industry database, you have a supply chain relationships database, and you can throw all these things together into one cohesive data store that allows you to do inferencing on top also, I might add. So an example of this, um, I put here, this, the earthquake in Japan in 2011. This is a very crude representation of the knowledge graph that we have. So what you see here are different colored nodes uh, so we have green ones for, for companies, purple ones for industries, yellow ones for, for people. On each of the company nodes, we have certain kinds of like financial indicators, things like, things like market cap, uh, revenue, long-term debt, short-term debt, free cash flow, those kind of things. And the idea is very much we know where certain plans are in the world. Right? We know that Merck, for instance, had a 
um, a factory producing a special kind of dye pigment in Japan. Um, that was actually hit by, by the earthquake, so the plants had to shut down. Now, as it turned out, the, that particular plant produced a special kind of dye, and it was the only plant in the world that produced that pigment that went into car paint that got sold to Toyota. So down the line, what we observed at some point was that Toyota had to put a hold on selling certain kinds of cars because they couldn't paint them anymore. And figuring out these kinds of connections and how that might have an impact down the line also like on car rental companies and so on uh, is, is a very strong and very uh, compelling application of using knowledge craft technology. Um, <coughs> I'm going to skip over this one. Another example um, to this end is what you see here is... Um, the, the stock price of, of Starbucks, again. Um, and what happened here, at some point, there was an economic indicator released um, saying that um, limited service eating places and nominal retail sales in the U.S. fell uh, to its like lowest values in about eight years. Now, you might think, this is interesting. Uh, what does that have to do with me? If you're holding Starbucks, um, you might realize this might have an impact on Starbucks down the line. So Starbucks actually reported their quarterly earnings a few weeks later, a few days later, I should say. Uh, and their shares fell. So you could have seen this coming in, in some sense. So using this kind of technology as a signaling uh, and reporting um, technique is, uh, is quite effective also. All right, so I touched on all these things very briefly. I might add, if you're interested in more details, come talk to me and grab me afterwards. Uh, I talked about news classification, identifying topics and companies and entities in there, um, extracting those things, interpreting them, and presenting them. Um, one thing I didn't really talk about in this context uh, is, is the level of speed and precision that we're doing this at. So typically when a new story comes in, this needs to be made available in like 100 milliseconds, which is uh, not a very long amount, of, uh, big amount of time to do all these kinds of analyses in, if you think about it, right? Um, and we also care deeply about precision, right? We'd rather not tag anything um, than tag something that we're not entirely um, certain about. Okay, so four more headlines. Uh, one thing I do want to mention is, in this context also is bias and credibility I already talked about, but also algorithmic fairness. Right? This is a thing uh, that has worked its head recently, where you have black box machine learning algorithms learning things based on, on, on data uh, that it observes in the wild. Um, I just want to mention here in this phase what we're doing. Um, first of all, we don't care much about black box machine learning. We like to understand what is happening. We care deeply about explainability and interpretability of those models. Um, and we find also that our clients do, right? It's one thing to just make a Bloomberg prediction that something is going to happen. Um, but more often than not, we find that people ask why and how do you come to this conclusion? How do you arrive there? And what did you do to get there? What were your steps? Can I reproduce it? And indeed nowadays, with technologies like Beacons, where you can run like a, an IPython notebook inside a terminal, you can actually verify those things yourself. We're increasingly uh, opening up also our backend stores. One final thing to note here is that the knowledge graph technology that I mentioned is also, uh, you can also use it to explain decisions, right? If you can actually piece out the parts or sort of the paths between certain uh, entities, you can actually use those for, uh, for explanatory purposes also. So that's it. I realize I'm slightly under. Uh, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the perfect timing and uh, <laughs> you're welcome <laughs> and also for a very interesting talk in a matter that, uh, that is uh, really increasing uh, as we now sit here it's of importance uh, questions from the audience at least I have uh, one question to start with is uh, um, you see this uh, trend for some years now, the sentiments in news, uh, important news, not in fake news, uh, how it affects the stock prices. And more and more people are looking into this um, to make money, basically. Yeah. You, know, you know, when the news comes out or the earnings come out, they, they, they are uh, vigilant and trade within, within a very fast time. So, uh, in a way, uh, it's not your fault, it's just where the go word is going, but isn't this also becoming more volatile? Uh, yeah. People, people are are even maybe wanting to automatically tweet, uh, which is not fake news, but based on on some news that are coming out, so they can know that people will react in a certain way in order to make more money. So, you, isn't this a, a source for instability also at the same time? It is for sure a source of instability or a potential one, right? Yeah. Um, I'm also not sure how to regulate that particular part of things. Um, another thing to note in this space is also that it is increasingly uh, common to basically create Twitter bots. You may have heard those things too, right? Like 
you can have sort of spin up artificial Twitter accounts. They would spin up, spill out, spew out information and data and opinions about a certain event that might indeed be happening, like an earnings call, for instance. Um, so one thing that we can do on our side, at least, is figure out and make sure that we don't uh, that we ignore that kind of noise. But you're right. I mean, in the general scheme of things, uh, this is something to be mindful of, if nothing else. Yes. How do you identify that, by the way? There are different ways that you can identify anomalies, um, either in the way that these accounts behave or how they behave with respect to normal, uh, quote-unquote, normal Twitter accounts. Yeah. Um, and you can use those uh, kind of outliers and kind of uh, anomaly detection algorithms to, well, at least get a signal whether or not something, might, something fishy might be happening there. But it's more about the network and not about the sentiment. You don't sentiment analyze the, the actual... Uh, Phenomenon. Yeah, that's right. You, you look at the actual source data itself to see yeah. if there's outliers. That's correct. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, any more questions? Oh, there. No, thanks for the presentation. One question. You, towards the end, you mentioned that you and your clients take an interest in explainable yes. artificial intelligence and machine learning as opposed to the black box sort of approach. Right. Yes. What tools do you have? What kind of methods do you use to actually ensure that, especially on an, both on an ex and ex ante and an ex post basis, that you can actually explain what is going on? Sure. Um, we guide that through a number of ways. Um, one is to use the actual machine learning algorithms and models that are indeed explainable, that you can actually go back to the data, you can actually point at like feature and feature values that you extract from the data, right? This particular story contains this term, and therefore we think it is um, relevant for this particular company, for instance. Other ways that we could do this is we have um, safeguards at the source. So I mentioned this large amount of training data that we gather internally from, from our internal editors and analysts. Um, we also do anomaly detection and those kind of things and bias detection on, on those annotations to make sure that we are, uh, well, there's the safeguards, really, to make sure that we don't stray too far. Perfect. Uh, any more questions? We have time for one. Two. <coughs> Not today. Okay, then thank you. Thanks. <laughs>
thanks to various technical breakthroughs, uh, extremely large amounts of information can now be retrieved and stored. Um, I mean, big data or large data sets, are, it's not completely new for, for, for us. I mean, statisticians and researchers and working with big data or, or large data sets for, for quite some time. Nowadays, however, there are better technical solutions. So, I mean, it's an, it can much better it's gather, store, structure, and analyze uh, increasingly uh, large amounts of data. Um, and in turn, this also creates a complete new way of extracting uh, knowledge. So the data revolution, of course, also affects us as central banks um, in how we use, both use and analyze data. Uh, and for, <laughs> traditionally, uh, aggregated time series data published with a time lag uh, is used to follow the economic uh, development. Non-traditional data could further improve our understanding of economic, uh, uh, economic development, and also if such data is available con on a continuous basis, we could more uh, quickly react to, to changes in the development. And this data revolution uh, challenged traditional thinking, not just regarding data captures uh, and analysis, it also requires new skills, new technology, and a fit-for-purpose organization. So machine learning um, has been developed in the interface between statistics and computer science. So put simply, machine learning focuses much more on predictions or forecasts, um, and it has a greater acceptance of a black box uh, approach. So the results are not typically kind of result from economic, based, uh, based on economic theory. And also when we have large data sets, we're able to use those data, that, that they say, data sets and for its different uh, purposes. So we can train, uh, we can let the model train itself um, and learn from subsets of observation and then evaluate it on other subsets of information. Traditional econometric analysis uh, adapted to develop for and develop for small data sets and aggregated data is based more on economic theory uh, and in this respect machine learning is less dependent on the theory and much more dependent on the, what the d data looks like, so much more data-driven. Data also, large data sets provides a uh, greater freedom of choice and functional form. So the large amount of information makes it more easier or more possible to detect complex, non-linear relationships that describes the data appearance better uh, than, than when you try to uh, enforce linear models to, 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 to evaluate the economic uh, uh, theory. So this is one example of, from, from uh, colleagues at the, our research department, which have looked at the, um, and it really shows the correlation between the Swedish limited company's profit as a share of total assets and default. And uh, in the blue dotted line there, you see using a conventional model, uh, um, that estimates the constant decline in default risk uh, with, with, um, with the default rate. An option with a flexible uh, spline uh, model uh, captured the empirical relationship in the data better and also clear that excess profits uh, in the right-hand corner is actually uh, instead uh, associated with, with increased risk. So these type of models um, non-linear uh, non models could be actually utilized and used to better understand uh, uh, and anal analyze uh, uh, banks' uh, uh, saving, uh, bay, uh, companies' uh, lending uh, strategies, uh, basically, and also support our financial stability monitoring. monitoring. Uh, and a lot of information captured on the internet is based on text, as I said, um, and uh, Another example from our research uh, department is uh, have, where they've constructed an economic policy uncertainty index based on text or text fragments. So basically, they scraped the National Library in Sweden for the, the, the complete online uh, database on, on newspapers and queried the archive for Swedish key phrases corresponding to their kind of equivalence of economic policy and uncertainty. It was then showed, so it's then showed that uh, increased uh, uncertainty measured with this index corresponds uh, with a uh, decrease in, in the GDP. An increased uncertainty measured in this index also uh, tends to increase household saving, 
uh, decrease the reef rates and increase uh, unemployment. So it suggests that this type of index, based on text information available, actually explains uh, uncertainty quite well, well in Sweden. So there's lots of new data, there's new methods, and there are also examples shown from research that this actually can be quite useful for, for, uh, for policy analysis. But we haven't, there's not yet many examples where you use this data and these methodologies in the day-to-day -day, uh, economist uh, toolbox, so to say. And there's a couple of barriers for that. I mean, we talked a little bit about the, the black box uh, uh, as, a, as a method. It's also about the data. I mean, we used to work on data which is kind of statistics. It's very well defined where it's coming from and so forth, whereas the data that comes from internet or other untraditional sources or non-traditional sources are not as uh, consistent, may not be comparable with countries or over time. Also, coming from a central bank, I think the institutional culture is quite important as well as a barrier. I mean, economists are... Um, it's more... It's, it's trained to... It's coming from a position where data mining is seen as a terrible crime, basically. I mean, data mining is not something that you, you, you will typically see from an economist. We're also trained to use a deductive scientific approach when one first develops the theory and then find the data to measure that theory and test the hypothesis around the theory. And of course, um, the data revolution and, and data science really flips that upside down, where you start with the data and see what the data looks like. Uh, so it's completely different. And I think that's also a barrier for us from, from, from a central up. From, from a central banking perspective. So one can ask, how do we go from here? So how do we create a change? Uh, well, we need, to de we need to lead these transformations and major cha change in this initiative. Uh, and this is a model from, um, uh, developed by John Cotter. He's a uh, professor in management, He's written a lot of books around this. Um, and uh, he's shown in research that leaders that see transformation as a process uh, are much more successful, that, successful than others in implementing change. And this process uh, consists of eight steps. So it's really about starting to, to by building a climate for change, by creating a sense of urgency. And this is really important to highlight heightened organizations' awareness that some things need to change. It's not just talk. Something actually needs to change. You need to find a form of uh, powerful uh, guiding coalition or team with a broad range of skills. Uh, would you trust the leadership to, to drive this change? You create a vision and, and, and initiatives that uh, and strict initiatives that work 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 on, on realizing that vision, and you need to communicate the vision and use the communication to teach that different behavior. Furthermore, leaders need to engage in enabling the whole organization in this change. Uh, so you need to empower others to uh, act in a vision by, for example, encourage risk taking which may be something strange to say for a central bank, but you need to make people to try something new. You need to plan for short-term wins by creating short-term projects uh, to uh, deliver visible performance in the short term. Um, and then also, finally, you also need to implement and sustain and change by sustaining acceleration and institutional change by articulating the connection between the new behaviors and organization success. So one example of this is uh, a practical example for this was a project we did a few years, few years back uh, where we were in this position. I mean, the Central Bank of Sweden, uh, like and other central banks, uh, the goal for that is to maintain price stability. And this is, keep, this is uh, interpreted as keeping inflation low and stable, around 2%. Um, and back in 2014, 15, 16, I mean, the inflation was way too low. And also, as you see with the forecast in yellow and blue, we had some, had some issues with our, with our forecasting. So there was a sense of urgency that something needed to be done to see if we can increase our, our forecasting ability. Um, I'm just going to skip through this. Uh, so, at, back at the time, um, there were uh, an area of growing interest was the, all the available price information online. And, uh, the Billion uh, Prices project done by uh, uh, Cavallo and Rigabon uh, has shown by that time a number, in a number of studies that this type of information actually was quite useful in, um, in um, uh, measuring inflation, basically. Uh, so... 
utilizing price information line could, could actually uh, solve a couple of problems for us. First of all, the information is uh, um, real time, so you collect it before the official uh, measure was, uh, is, uh, is um, available. The price information also, if you collect it yourself, you can get a lot of more details on this price information, so you can get more understanding if changes in prices or price uh, index actually are permanent or not. Uh, and finally, the data, data collection could potentially also be automated, which actually makes it possible for you to collect this price information quite cheaply uh, and without much resources. So we put together a small team, a diverse team, from, uh, including people from research who knew a little bit about how to create this type of workflows. We have people from forecasting, knowing people about the, the, actual, the current forecast, and also from, from statistics. Uh, so small, diverse team. And the main questions we started with asking yourselves was, are we able to scrape prices at all? Is that possible for us to do? And will these prices add value to our short-term forecasting? So the second, second question. And then if this was possible, could we actually maintain, a and, and, maintain and, 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 uh, and run a consistent uh, workflow doing this? But we want to start small, because I mean, you just want to can't just start scrape everything. So we started with the fruit and vegetable prices. I mean, that's a quite volatile category. So why not start there? Just a short look at the fruit and vegetable prices you see it here. It's quite volatile, but even the fruit and vegetable prices are um, uh, quite funny with the, the, the signs there. But <laughs> I'm not sure where that's coming from, but <laughs> it's just the, the year, year over time. Uh, but even all the fruit and vegetables, I mean, lots of fruit and vegetables in the market, so you can, won't, don't want to collect all those things as well. So why not just start with the main ones? So we started to co collect information on oranges, apples, bananas, cucumber, peppers, and tomato. It's a very concrete, and you see the, the solid line is quite correlated with the, the t total fruit and, and vegetable category. So we thought just doing this could actually give us some, some, some good results. So this was the, the uh, kind of the workflow that was developed. It was not developed in one go during the project. So basically we started with the first part of the collect data collection, and it was done with a scraper. So we, collected, we developed scrapers that every morning we visited websites to collect the code from, 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 the, from their servers. And then from that we extracted the product the names and the prices of the, the fruit and vegetables we're interested in. Those mer files were merged into one time series. And then we also had some automatic scans to make sure that the files that we collected actually contained the information that we were interested in. When the data was collected, uh, we built another workflow to just create these indices. So we sorted the, the data in the categories, so the bananas, bananas for, for one part, and then the apples and so forth. We mimicked the, the, the data to be the same as the way that Statistics Sweden actually measured these prices, so we're actually dealing with the same thing. And then we collect, calculated the average prices, and finally we also calculated the average uh, price on the complete index. But this was very much an iterative process, so to make sure that we, we got forward. But this was how, how it looked in the, in, the, in, the, in the first time. We were able to get data from Statistics Sweden uh, at a detailed level, and that made it possible for us to, de to kind of monitor the price development, the, the index uh, from, from day one. So the CPI here is from the Statistics Swedish the official measure data, uh, and the red one is from, from, from our index. So you can see, for example, the correlation for tomato. It follows fairly well, and we're able to see quite quick that, well, there is something in this. So after already kind of a month, you can see that this is actually uh, doing something for us. So, but, it's, uh, but you see, it could tomato, cucumber, and pepper is very good correlation, whereas orange is, for some reason, is very bad correlation. So that's it's kind of what you, what, what you get with, 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 with this, in a way. Uh, from here, we went, uh, it, it created some uh, proof and confidence within the uh, people at the uh, uh, leadership board that actually this is something we, we, it's interesting, so we should actually go on and cre create an index as well for this. So just using the weights, uh, we created an, an CPI, an online pri uh, pilot price index based on this, and it correlated with it the complete uh, uh, fruit and vegetable index for, for the CPI. It's not perfect, uh, but it still have a fairly good correlation, and we're able to get this information the, the kind of a couple of weeks before the official index is, is, is produced. Also, uh, at the time, we had two different uh, econometrical models to actually predict the price development for this category. And we also want to con con compare with, with that, of course. So 
we used uh, to, at the time we had a, uh, there was a lot of indicators that would either summarize the internal mean forecast or a principal component forecast. So you see those there. And then we used the root mean square error uh, to just compare those two uh, procedures with our online price, price procedure. And it was a quite short time period and so forth, but all in all, it is still indicated that using the online price information actually beat the current, uh, current uh, forecasts uh, methods that we had at that time. So uh, now we've, <laughs> we've been collecting data for quite some time, all the way, so yeah, year, year again. Um, and it's uh, continuously yielding fairly good information for us on, on, um, on the fruit and vegetable uh, information. Also, uh, we have started to started a few years ago also to collect uh, flight prices in a similar fashion. And the reason behind that was that we, uh, Statistics Sweden, redid the way they actually collected those prices. We completely changed the seasonal pattern and. This is also quite big uh, differen differentiation in, 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 in vol volatile price index, which drive the whole index if it's changing. And by scraping the flight prices, we're quite easily for us to make sure that we're not far off uh, that index when we, when we, when we go into to, to decision making. However, this is not kind of coming uh, free of charge. As you see, there's some, especially in the end here, quite big differences between an online price index and the, the official one. So we, we, and this is basically due to the fact that some of the retailers that the scrape information from completely redid their, 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 their websites. And this was not something that our automatic quality uh, process uh, found either. So. Data, it, it's, it's uh, some work to develop these, uh, these scrapers and data collection methods, but also, I mean, you need to continue, continue to maintain and look at these uh, scrapers as well, because it's not, it's not coming com completely free. So, just to kind of wrap up on, on the, the, the um, uh, scraping uh, project, so, we proved that it was possible to automate the online data collection, but data is not coming completely free of charge. There is a maintenance part. And it's also important that you have the right uh, the, the competence in here. So at the time, we only had uh, one person, basically, within the bank who were able to develop these type of things. So it's also get quite personal dependent. So that's something to think about as well. The data online is actually quite informative. Uh, it can use, be used for, for, uh, useful for, for indicators, and, uh, which is kind of good to have as well. And the scraping pilot, maybe the most important thing, the scraping pilot also built a trust in, in, in organization and supported us to continue this uh, transformation process. So it was not just talking about scraping or machine learning or whatever. It was actually something that clearly proved to the organization that this data made a difference in their day-to-day -day job. Uh, and that's kind of what's, uh, what's important, I think, in, in when, you, when you develop these things. So currently, we are um, together with um, uh, our IT department and also other parts. We are now developing our analytical infrastructure to, to be able to do more of these things. Uh, and we always some, quite often come back to this case that it's not just talk. It's actually something that benefits for, for us. We have been able to expand our team, so we have recruited a data scientists this year, so we also now, much more people within the bank are able to code in Python, R, and so forth, uh, which help us to set up things like this much easier and without having this, uh, this personal, personal dependency. And we also started, uh, around this time as well, an artificial intelligence start, uh, study group with the focus of having people from different parts of the bank sharing knowledge uh, and pooling together people to drive specific pilot projects on new issues. So uh, currently we're focusing quite a lot of text analysis. So we have one, one policy project related to a monetary policy where we see if text information actually can yield a better, give us better information to forecast um, uh, economic development like GDP. And we also have a policy project within the uh, um, uh, financial stability side where we look at bank reports and bank information to see if that the text information actually can give us better information when monitoring uh, bank development and, and, and financial stability. But to me, um, 
the pilot project is a good way to start. Um, but it also, it, kind of the whole thing, it really proves that you need the sense of urgency to get started. Uh, you need to be able to deliver results that some that kind of measure, have real yield measurable measurable results, and um, uh, when you have that, uh, you can actually have the uh, opportunity to go on and, and uh, furthermore uh, develop the uh, change in in your in your organization. Thank you. Okay, now it's time for questions. There we have one immediately, I think. <laughs> Hi, uh, Pascal Gauthier with Nordic Investment Bank. Thanks very much for sharing very practical and, and useful uh, exercises. I'd be interested in, in two things. One is the scraping part. Did you take essentially a shotgun approach where you got everything you could and then filter or, de or structure afterwards, or did you already kind of look at the way CPI is doing it and structure regionally and by store and so on? That's first. And the second is maybe I've misunderstood something, but when you were showing correlations to the existing series, I thought, why were you so concerned about that? Because wasn't the value to kind of reveal something new, knowing that the previous forecast was constantly overshooting actual inflation? So uh, kind of, so to say, fitting with the existing series may not be of value in that case. Or maybe I misunderstood something. Thanks. Thank you for the questions. Well, on the first question, we, we did the shotgun approach in the, in the scraping part, so we, but that was much easier. Just get all the data from the web on, on that category uh, on the web patients. And later on, we filtered the data and, uh, and uh, mimicked the, the, um, the, the way that Statistics Sweden, Sweden did it. Uh, on, the, on the other question, it's more, uh, I mean, when we and I show the, uh, pic, uh, the, the slides on um, the online price index and the CPI. Um, I mean, the CPI is the, the, the measure that we are um, evaluated against. So it's kind of unquestionable in a sense. So uh, that's the official index of, of the price index. So it's not really questionable. But it is a question, though, when we got quite big differences in result is, I mean, we get all the prices for oranges, for example, on the major retailers. And we still we're not correlating those prices with the official index, and we know that uh, that uh, the, stat the official in uh, the official stat index is not based on that, a total sample. So, who's really right? But it's not really for us to say. <laughs> uh, in, in that sense, it's more so. It's a difference. Thanks. Okay. Uh, thanks. That was a really insightful talk with the examples as well. I'm kind of going to pick up on the last question uh, the gentleman asked as well. So kind of looking at what your vision is for, say, that example using CPI, using the official data as the benchmark and as the gold standards, I guess kind of we've had some good talks by uh, Eurostat was an example that comes to mind about the kind of uncertainty in those kind of measure measurements and how you measure that. So would your vision be that over time these are kind of you'd use the range of measures as a kind of robust toolkit to assess CPI, or is it just to use it to target CPI? Because it would seem to me that over time, as kind of re retailing online becomes, we'd expect to become a bigger part. It's not obvious why the official statistics would be better than the one you've come up with. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, I mean, I, it's two two ways. I mean, for a central bank, we are not our main purpose is not to collect price information. <laughs> so it's 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 it's, mer it's it's mostly used just to ensure that we have good in indicators to forecast inflation. So that's a big difference. However, statistics um, Sweden and other 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 um, statistical agencies as well. They are moving more and more to to scrape uh, scrape prices both from a efficiency point of view, but also in, in, in getting uh, broader, broader samples. But, yeah, I think, I think there's still, still is a sense of urgency. I mean, we could go on and scrape other prices as well and get good, better indicators for other categories in, within, within the CPI. But the sense of urgency is not there. So un un unless you have that, it will, not, it will not happen. Thank you. More questions? Thank you, Marcus. This was a very, very, very nice presentation and gave me a lot of ideas uh, to go forward in my own work. Um, 
I, there's one question. Uh, like before, before you started into this project, um, did you did you look into that if there's any uh, like commercial vendors providing the same opportunity or the same service as you know just the thought of us starting your own web scraping within a central bank? I mean, that must have been a somewhat hard hard, hard idea to uh, to uh, push forward to begin with. So I ca towards the end, you kind of mentioned the very big foretale of this that you know the matured the organization as a whole but was this foreseen as a uh, as a valid outcome of this project or or did you even consider uh, maybe going to outside vendor for th for this kind of a service first thank you yeah i mean th th during this time it was a big it was an inflation project consisting of lots of different initiatives whereas this initiative was one of those and we also looked at other data vendors. So there are um, other data vendors that actually collect this type of information and, and sell it to the market. But it's expensive. <laughs> it's very expensive. So that, it wouldn't be worth going that, down that route. Uh, and since they had the competence of doing this type, type of stuff in-house, in, in uh, we just made it really small. And by making it really small, it was not as a, seen as a big project by, by, the, by the leaders. And we can just kind of do this stepwise. So just, let's just see if you can scrape these six uh, fruit and vegetables. Let's see if this actually makes any sense. Yes, actually, this seems to be better than what we are doing at the moment. Well, let's expand on this a little bit. So it's, it's really about uh, building the product in the right way and, and, and communicating it in a way that doesn't, it need, doesn't need to be big. But now it became a bit bigger, but it, just, it, came, it came stepwise. Perfect. Time for one more question. Okay. Well, thanks a lot. Yes, this is great. Um, and a lot of central banks are looking at what you have been doing. Uh, can you elaborate more on the policy use or the policy interest for these kind of indicators? Because... Um, if I can explain a little bit. So what you have been doing also at the Fed, what they are doing at the ECB, basically you try to monitor, uh, to, to forecast volatility, and by definition you focus on fresh food and uh, oil prices, etc. But at the end of the day, I presume that there is interest to understand the mechanism there behind this volatility. But once this is done, then the interest is very low for the policymakers because they are interested in, in core inflation and slow-moving movements. And by definition, these uh, automatized techniques, they just look at the volatile movement and they forget about the rest. Mm. So uh, what's your view on this? Yeah, as I said, I mean, what could say, I mean, central banks creating, scraping six fruit and vegetables. I mean, it's, it's, it's a bit strange. I, I, <laughs> I can see that. But I think the, the main issue, the main um, thing for me is trust. So, and... When you have big volatility in categories within the within inflation uh, basket, uh, the price basket, and you don't get that right on the, on the, on the, on the month ahead basis, but it's, it's not temporary, it's just there, and we are measured on the year on year inflation. A one month uh, inflation uh, error would actually live with you for the coming 12 months. So, especially if you have uh, kind of low inflation in the first place, and you also then do this uh, forecast error, you will live this for, for 12 months. So it's about, it's about trust, really. So, and this information is there. Uh, why should we not collect it? And, and it makes our lives much easier if we just get the more sense of truth before, before we publish our, uh, our, our official, uh, official forecasts. So the policy use is really to be right. <laughs> and then increase trust in that we know what we're doing. That's, uh, that's my, my take on it. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, now it's time for a short break. Uh, we're going to have uh, refreshments uh, with um, eco-friendly and environment-friendly coffee again. Uh, I also hope that you enjoy the other refreshments there. Uh, let's get back here in half an hour or 10.30. Uh, and then we continue with session two. Thank you. Ah, uh, the second session for the day.
Okay, thank you. Uh, let's continue with the seventh session for this conference. Uh, it's called New Trends Shaping Financial Services. Artificial intelligence and big data technology uh, advances, uh, advances rapidly. Uh, what are the current major trends? How will these emerging technologies shape the future of financial services? And what are the major type of risks contained in these technologies? We have one sp speaker in this session, and it's uh, Matthew Blake, Head of uh, Financial and Monetary Systems Initiative from World Economic Forum. He, he couldn't uh, join us physically today, unfortunately, so he has uh, made a video for us to um, enjoy. Um, Matthew Blake heads the World Economic Forum's Financial and Monetary System Initiative, which explores how regulation, tech-enabled innovation and competition are reshaping the global financial system. His team is also responsible for the Forum's financial inclusion efforts globally. He has uh, worked in, in, in several uh, institutions like uh, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Uh, he has uh, several backgrounds in, in very good universities from uh, uh, Harvard, Boston, and, and other top universities. But um, without further ado, let's uh, listen and, and watch uh, Matthew Blake uh, through video. Good afternoon. My name is Matthew Blake. I run the financial services team here at the World Economic Forum. My apolo apologies first and foremost for not being physically with you today. Due to commitments here in New York City, I was unable to attend the conference. Today, I plan to speak to the forum's work on artificial intelligence and appropriate data use in financial services, both of which tie into the theme of data-driven financial stability, which is a core part of your discussions over the last day and a half. Before we get into the presentation in earnest, for those less familiar with my organization, I thought I'd spend a minute or two describing the World Economic Forum. We are the International Organization for Public-Private Cooperation celebrating our 50th year in existence this coming January. We are a global, independent, future-oriented platform that works with a diverse set of stakeholders across business, 1,000 global companies across 20 industry sectors, to be precise, in addition to the official sector, sector, academia, and civil society. The forum is organized across 19 different platforms, the work described today falls under the platform on the future of financial and monetary systems. Fundamentally, each one of these platforms aim to do three core things. First, to build awareness around various topics of strategic interest. Second, to shape mindsets and build agendas that focus on global public opinion. And third, and perhaps most importantly, to drive collective action through consortia building and partnerships. The body of work focused on financial services cuts across five key dimensions at present. It's an evolving portfolio and it does change from time to time, but these are relatively consistent dimensions, with the first four being the most relevant for today's discussion. From left to right, business transformation. This is technology-fueled innovation, driving a modularization of the financial system which has created a set of opportunities and challenges as new competitors seek to disrupt the value chain. Second, on risk and resil resilience, digitalization is also influencing risk, potentially amplifying old risks like credit and market risk, while introducing new risks such as cyber risk and the inappropriate use of customer data, a topic that we'll delve into in a bit of time. Third, we focus on technological change and the fact that it is prompting a revisiting of established governance and policy frameworks requiring that new ones be created to adapt. Fourth, and importantly, demographic change, coupled with technological advances or reshaping career and retirement paradigms. This is an area of focus for the team. And last, and we won't spend um, much time at all today on this particular topic, but nonetheless, it's very important that firms must adapt to be much more sustainable in order to maintain business relevance and customer loyalty. So we are working on all five of these thematics at all points in time during the year. We have a very diverse set of stakeholders that work with us um, across the year. As you can see, it's a uh, compilation of incumbents 
innovators in the public sector and a smattering from time to time from civil society as I referenced. But it's important to note that the views that I will express during my presentation emanate from these bodies and generally represent a overarching view on opinions and perspectives around the world. Another important piece of information is that these perspectives are sourced through numerous workshops, including hundreds of participants, in addition to uh, expert interviews. And we've been running work around these topics for quite some time. So now into the meat of the presentation. For the bulk of today's presentation, covering some high-level observations on how AI is reshaping the financial sector, as well as the forum's work on the appropriate use of customer data in financial services, I want to make specific reference to the reports that I'm drawing upon. For the AI piece, there are two in particular. The first, the new physics of financial services, which explores the implications of AI on the dominant operating models in financial services, as well as changes in competitive dynamics across the financial services ecosystem. The second is a more recent publication that we put out in October called Navigating Uncharted Waters, which looks at the thorny issues such as algorith algorithmic fairness, collusion, AI and systemic risk, among other topics specific to artificial intelligence and its role within the financial sector. Both of these reports, as well as the information referenced on appropriate data use, are available in the public domain. You can just go to our website and download the documents. So what do we mean by AI? When business people we've talked to talk about AI, they typically are not talking about a particular technical approach or a well-defined school of computer science, per se. Rather, they are talking about a set of capabilities that allow them to run their business in a new way. At the core, these capabilities are almost always a suite of technologies enabled by adaptive predictive power and it exhibiting some degree of autonomous learning that have made dramatic advances in our ability and their ability to use machines to automate and enhance. Specifically, these pieces of automation and enhancement include detecting patterns in large, regular and irregular data sets, the ability to generate foresight to determine the probability of future events with greater accuracy, customization, AI allows for the ability of institutions to optimize financial outcomes by tailoring recomm and recommending and advising customers in a better way. Decision making, augmented decision making across the board and enhanced uh, processes there. And last, interaction with financial institutions via digital or analog mediums. AI enables all of these pieces and subsequently we're seeing it drive leaner, faster operations, much more highly tailored products and advice, smarter decision making, and new value propositions across the ecosystem. It became clear from our research that the gap between early adopters of AI and those that hesitated would be significant in terms of increased cash flow and profitability. With early adopters, meaning those with a degree of adoption within five to seven years from this point in time, substantially outpacing slower movers by a large margin. Early adoption would have substantial trickle-through effects on front and back office efficiencies, as well as the firm's strategy vis-a-vis -vis alliances and partnerships, infrastructure, and talent. But early adoption is not without risks. Those identified through our work include, among others, the risk of customer backlash from AI failures that damage brand equity and trust, the potential risk of regulatory backlash that prompts additional scrutiny or censure, and last, the significant risk of alienating and demotivating employees, depriving them of human agency, or prompting panic about impending layoffs. Further observations include the bonds that traditionally held financial institutions together will begin to weaken. Operating models 
will be fundamentally reshaped as the result of ubiquitous AI use. This will drive the formation of bifurcated markets where scale and agility win at the expense of mid-scale players. More specifically, the recipe for success for dominant financial institutions in the past will likely not be a successful formula in the future. Traditional ingredients, when we break them down for success, include economies of scale in terms of balance sheet assets. But with AI, the scale of one's data and sophistication of deployed algorithms will absolutely trump traditional size considerations. A second ingredient, ingredient traditionally for success included one's branch network or international footprint, the standardization of products, and their ability to drive cost efficiencies uh, and revenue growth. However, today with AI sophistications comes much more tailored experiences that can create personalized products and services from anywhere in the world. Traditionally, the exclusivity of relationships, access to markets and investors was a critical differentiator. However, yet again, with AI, connections are digitized and optimization between parties becomes the critical differentiator. Customer stickiness has historically served as an important element of retention, and this remains true to today. Yet again, with AI, product innovation and performance will be much more critical to maintaining clients according to our work. And last, human dependent interactions will be replaced by the interplay of tech and talent to amplify the client's experience. This transformation is triggering and will continue to significantly influence the financial services eco ecosystem for years to come, including a remake of front and back office functions, a reconfiguration of structure and regulation of markets, as well as important societal considerations. Our work has identified nine critical areas of transformation. Here I cherry pick three key issues from this list that you see before you for brevity. First, from cost center to profit center. AI enabled back office processes can be improved more rapidly by offering them as a service to competitors. This means that processes continuously learn and improve using data from their collective users, improving at a rate faster than could be achieved by any one institution acting alone. This creates a defensible advantage in efficiency and a sustained revenue source for the institution into the future. Uneasy data alliances. Partnership development is becoming a critical competitive competency. Effectively developing the right data partnerships while mitigating potential tensions in those relationships will allow firms to develop unique and differentiated products, insights, and experiences. By large technology companies will become critical sources of data and customer experience due to their data advantage and will increasingly play a critical role in the financial services value proposition. Smaller incumbent financial institutions will be at a negotiating disadvantage to access customers and data, particularly if those same technology companies that the smaller players are looking to access already have relationships with major financial services providers. The power of data regulators. This is number seven on the, on the slide before you. Regulations governing the privacy and portability of data will shape the relative ability of financial and non-financial institutions to deploy AI, thus becoming as important as traditional regulations to the competitive positioning of firms. Lastly, new ethical dilemmas, or number nine, AI will necessitate a re-examination of principles and supervisory techniques to address the ethical gray areas and regulatory uncertainties that currently stand in the way of adoption or of even more transformative AI capabilities. In sum, the growing role of AI in shaping the future of the financial system will require financial institutions to do two things simultaneously. First, be first and best in AI development and deployment. Because institutions able to establish an 
early lead in using AI as a competitive differentiator will be rewarded by virtuous feedback cycles that compound their advantages and leave second movers struggling to catch up. The second important piece to move on simultaneously is collaboration with many stakeholders. Because unlocking the full potential of AI requires an extensive network of partnerships and only collective efforts by financial institutions alongside regulators and the broader public sector can ensure that the expanded use of AI in finance benefits society at large. Building on that last point, to unlock the full potential of AI requires contending with a few key challenges. One is overcoming the risk of inappropriate data use. And again, we'll spend a few minutes later on this. Second is contending with algorithmic fairness. The risk of an algorithm inadvertently generating biased conclusions that discriminate against a protected class. Combating potential alg algorithmic collusion AI may learn to collude to keep prices at disadvantaged levels for customers while benefiting the firm, and sometimes doing so without the firm even being aware of it. Safeguarding against systemic risk called, caused by AI agents, which may build up new sources of systemic risk, as well as radically altering the way financial crises, crises unfold. And last, solving for AI explainability, very tricky issue. There's currently a lack of consensus on when and how to make algorithms more transparent. On slide 13, we talk about some of the key findings from Navigating Uncharted Waters, reporting which a report that was published in October 2019. And here I lay out six key findings to unlock the potential of AI. I will close the AI segment by summarizing these here. So first, AI systems think in a way that is deeply foreign to humans and fundamentally different from the systems of the past. This creates new risks in the financial sector. Therefore, faced with this foreignness, much of the old governance toolkit becomes ineffective. Responsibly harnessing AI's potential requires an openness to new modes of governance. And this will push everyone uh, and test everyone's ability to be creative and prudent. A second piece relates to the use of AI um, in prompting a cross-industry re-examination of comp competition policy, data rights, and operational resilience with potentially profound implications for how the financial institutions deploy AI and the broader set of strategic choices at their disposal going forward. And last, responsible AI is not just about doing no harm. AI capabilities can also enable the financial sector to raise the ethical bar on how it serves clients and society at large, potentially leaving financial institutions uniquely positioned in a way to uh, steward the governance of data and trust first AI models. AI decisions are dependent on data and as referenced at several points during our discussion on AI in the financial system, how data is used in an ethical or appropriate manner, financial services uh, firms play an important role in determining um, how data is used and how to differentiate their role from other actors within the ecosystem. Through interviews and workshops, the World Economic Forum has canvassed numerous jurisdictions looking for answers on how data should be used by financial services firms to this, in this regard, while testing this op the opportunity to align globally on principles governing the use of data for financial institutions. This work culminated in a set of global principles, which I will touch upon at a high level today. These principles are being considered for endorsement among a number of large traditional financial institutions as they endeavor to make explicit how they manage customer data. First, let's reaffirm what everybody knows, that the exponential growth of customer data available on all of us uh, is increasing at a um, 
at a rem remarkable and dramatic pace. In addition to traditional financial services data and financial transaction data, health, biometrics, social, location, media behaviors are now all tabul tabulated and scrutinized in ways that often cross what one might consider the creepy threshold. In our discussions globally on appropriate data use in financial services, five key challenges slash opportunities were consistently surfaced. First, there are varying stakeholder incentives regarding appropriate data use. For example, customers appreciate that data about them can help to create tailored products and services, but express concerns about privacy and other risks from data misuse. Business, of course, wants to leverage customer data to generate insight and create profit, but it's unclear on how to, for them, on how to adapt to changing regulations and public sentiment. Finally, while the official sector is generally eager to spur innovation and growth, it's also mindful of the risks to customers that may weaken trust in the financial system. There are significant regional, societal, and cultural differences regarding cultural data, regarding customer data, access and use, which also adds a level of significant complexity. With that said, and in more recent times, our discussions on this topic um, point to an increasing awareness and concern of data misuse among customers around the globe. We feel this is a very important trend as it pushes and, and prompts us to think around a convergence with respect to how people are thinking about customer privacy. Third, there is a major complexity inherent in the numerous uh, data types, uses, and collection techniques that needs to be grappled with. Fourth, there's a lack of common global principles available to help frame issues. And lastly, there are issues of practical regulator regulation and implementation that complicate the oper operationalization of global principles. And our work essentially focused on an exploration of all five with a drill down on number four and five on page 16. Through numerous interactions with stakeholders around the globe, the World Economic Forum drove consensus around five key principles underpinning the appropriate use of customer data. Each of these principles, which at the highest level and at the risk of oversimplification here on this one uh, reduced slide, are captured um, on page 17. It is very important to underline that each of these dimensions, consent, control, security, transparency, reciprocity, referenced on the left, is further detailed with a set of specific considerations that get at the heart of each. I will reference a few examples for purposes of illustration here. These principles, like our other work, are available on the forum's website, along with the supporting white papers that led to their creation. Let's take consent uh, first. Consumers should be able to give or deny their consent to companies gathering usage or storage of their data. Companies should clearly outline and communicate their data policies, including notification of legitimate uses where consent is not sought. Underlying this principle are a set of stipulations touching on what we mean by informed consent, what is entailed in the ability to revoke consent, a definition around legitimate use, as well as data collection policies. So those different dimensions support this consent uh, principle, but are not outlined here on this slide for brevity. Similarly, taking the security principle, which reads, customers should expect their private data to be held securely. Companies should be held responsible and accountable for data security, including breaches, abuse, or misuse. This particular principle is underpinned by considerations ranging from the approach to security breach notification, to traceability, to safeguarding data integrity. The uniqueness of this exercise and the principles themselves is centered around the completeness, uh, it's not centered around necessarily the completeness of these principles. Our stakeholders, the 65 to 70 companies that work very closely with us across the globe on developing these principles, think they're solid. However, everyone recognizes the fact that the data landscape is an evolving one. So the true value 
resides rather in the fact that they represent, to the best of our knowledge, the only truly global compilation of data principles created at this time. And again, our process in terms of developing these and the underlying factors that support them uh, was derived from global interaction um, on every continent uh, uh, across the globe. Importantly, these principles are deemed more stringent than what is articulated in GDPR, which is the European standard that you are all very familiar with. Before I conclude, um, it's important to point out that during our conversations that led to the build out of the principles, we intersected with many policymakers, perhaps some of you in this room, uh, on the topic of appropriate data use in financial services. It became very clear that the official sector was exposed to significant trade-offs when considering how to govern data use in the financial sector, and we thought it would be appropriate to list a few key considerations here. Um, I will cherry pick uh, just four of the list that's represented on page 18 before you. So first, customer autonomy versus effective anti-financial crime uh, measures. The creation of a single client view in an effort to combat financial crime makes a tremendous amount of intuitive sense, yet may not be possible due to the banking secrecy and regulations um, and other bank, banking secrecy regulations and other restrictions. Secondly, innovation ability, innovation ability versus system integrity. Effective cybersecurity controls can overburden young startups which can stifle innovation. Conversely, lax restrictions threaten security of customer data and the integrity of the broader financial system. Explainability versus model efficiency and efficacy. To revert back to a theme cited in the AI discussion, a black box algorithm, algorithm may in some cases deliver better outcomes for customers and companies alike, but that financial, but that financial institutions then might not be able to explain how a certain outcome was generated. This is a significant hurdle to broader AI adoption as previously discussed. And again, representative of a trade-off that policymakers are confronted with uh, front and center. And last, customer choice versus equal treatment. Regulatory frameworks that allow customers to freely access, download, and share data with innovators or tech platforms are assumed to improve efficiency, benefit customer choice, and altogether support innovation. However, the effects on established players, the larger financial institutions and the incumbents, are less appreciated as the direction of data sharing is often viewed as a one-way street. This concludes my presentation today. I thank you very much for listening um, and hope that this uh, discussion on AI and appropriate data use from the vantage point of the World Economic Forum accretes to your overall discussions over the last day and change. If you'd like to reference the reports, as mentioned previously, uh, that were sourced for the information provided, they are available on our website. And certainly, if you have any specific follow-up questions or areas of inquiry, do not hesitate to reach out to me directly. I wish you a terrific conference. And again, I am there with you in spirit. Thanks very much. Okay, uh, we give a thank you uh, from here to New York. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, uh, I, I, I will not be able to answer that uh, since I'm not a psychic. Um, we're going to go instead to session eight. Uh, it's called Future of Financial Stability. Will a more data-driven financial ecosystem be more efficient and stable, or will it increase systemic vulnerabilities and extreme phenomena? What will be the role of data giants in, in financial markets? And this session is a little bit different. This is the last session. We're going to have three uh, speakers uh, speaking 20 minutes, uh, including this introduction that I gave. And then we're not going to have questions, but instead, after the three speakers, we're going to have a panel discussion here in front. So then it's going to be time also for the audience to place questions to, to these three speakers. And the first one is uh, uh, Klaus Wiedner, uh, Director, DG Financial Stability, Financial Services and Capital Markets, European Commission. 
Dr. Klaus Wiener is Director for Financial Surveillance and Crisis Management in DG FISMA um, in, of the European Commission. His re responsibilities include monitoring financial markets and institutions, policy development related to the banking union and the Europe's role in the financial sector globally, country surveillance, macroeconomic policy impact assessment of financial sector regulation and bank resolution in close cooperation with the Single Resolution Board. Thank you, Klaus, for coming here. The floor is yours. <laughs> Not before. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> All right. Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for, for inviting uh, the Commission to this conference. <clears throat> um, obviously, listening to what I heard this morning just confirms that, you know, as a European policymaker, regulator, you see things are changing and very fast, and you're looking around and say, okay, so what do we do? And some say, okay, no, yeah, you have to act, act, regulate quickly. No, no, wait, wait. You have to let them develop first, uh, all these startups that are around you. And um, obviously, that puts us in a, in a quite uh, difficult uh, position. What do you have to put here? Green. The green one? Okay, very good. So, obviously, the, as you know, the new commission now is in the first week in, in office. Um, one of the priorities of the new president is digitalization. How do we deal with it? Obviously, it's a broader um, idea, but also very relevant for financial services. And, and so what we're trying to understand is this digital transformation of the financial sector, what are the consequences that we have? So we're trying to map out what's happening now or what's going to happen in, in, in the future, both for consumers, for business, but also for financial stability, obviously. Um, that's extremely important. And uh, the issue, obviously, is it's fast-moving. It's a global trend. It's multidimensional. I think that's the, the worst, I think, for, for, for a regulator to understand what uh, should be done. So if you look then at the... Um, uh, the services that are rendered now on the basis of data and artificial intelligence, um, you see that it starts off with uh, authentication, but you know that much better than me, uh, digital wallets, cloud computing, credit scoring, and then robo-advice, and now we understand that we already have um, the possibilities to execute contracts by artificial intelligence. So it just shows how quickly, how quickly it goes from one service to the next. Also, we see the landscape changing. Obviously, we're in Europe very bank-centric traditionally. Um, now, you know, you have fintechs coming up, you have, you have big techs coming in, um, crypto assets. So all these phenomena that, you, that we see. Um, so uh, for us, that's really the, the question. I mean, we have been, and I will come to that back later, we have been in this at some at some crossroads, uh, like PSD2, and I'll have a word about this, about the payment accounts and, and open um, access. But uh, I think the big wave is still to come. And now what we're trying to do is to, to map, actually, what um, first, before we do any, any policy action, what, what are the consequences, really, um, for consumers, businesses, and, and, and financial stability. So obviously, for consumers, and I'll go that in a bit more detail, um, there are certainly advantages, but also risks. Uh, competition, there's always the question of access. Uh, if you know, new data comes in and financial stability, that's very varied from crypto assets to cyber attacks, uh, price volatility. But I'll go in, into those a bit more in detail now. So uh, the first one on, um, on consumers. Um, well, first, um, I think the artificial intelligence and data has the potential of um, giving the supervisor and uh, a better better possibility to detect fraud, uh, money laundering, compliance report might be easier. So that could be uh, at least a, pos a possibility that things are getting better because we have uh, an improved and, and, and more uh, sane business process. I mean, that's one of the things that... Um, uh, we're hoping, obviously, that presupposes the supervisors um, are up to speed and they can, you know, retrieve the data uh, that they get. Otherwise, it will not work. Um, so we're working also to see uh, the, to what extent can we help to have um, make sure that the skills are out there at the at the authorities level. 
Then, and that's obviously important for us, is the question of, of market integration. We're, we're trying to build a single market financial services for for um, some decades, but uh, we're not quite there yet. And obviously, um, these new technologies that might give you the, the possibility, obviously, um, to have more of this uh, cross-border services enhanced market integration. I think that's another you know, uh, potential benefit that we can have. And that goes obviously hand in hand with the fact that the, the customer um, normally should have a better service, you know, 24 seven access uh, to whatever questions, statements, um, uh, claims handling, uh, whatever. So, so the service as such um, um, should, should, should develop in, in, in that uh, respect, we hope. Um, the problem obviously is all of this is, is kind of, um, empowering the consumer, but presupposes also that the consumer is somehow uh, an informed customer. Because, um, you know, you get a lot of things in the internet, you have, you have, um, you get robo advice, you need to understand the risk, for example, that is, that is linked to that. Um, you as yourself provide data as a customer, and you need to know, okay, do I give my consent or not? And what is the consequence of that? And obviously, there's always the risk also of, of discriminatory practices, um, you know, that start with algorithms that are fed somehow. And then obviously, the problem is, depending on how they're fed, that can have different uh, consequences. Now, we saw that sometimes in credit scoring already that, uh, you know, some people start complaining that, okay, they didn't get it because they didn't fit the matrix. Uh, okay, so the question is then uh, at what point you stop and you look at it, um, you know, a human is going to look at it. But there's at least all this again, shows that for consumers we have uh, broadly, I think, a lot of uh, benefits, but as always with new technologies also um, risks. Then there's the question of, of le the level playing field. Um, uh, as I said, I mean, the, the landscape is changing, um, and, uh, and the question is, um, do we need a level playing field in big techs and the, the incumbents? I think mean, it's one of the big questions that uh, that we need to ask ourselves, and um, what is the key for, for fair competition? Because if, if data is, is, is the real issue, then the question is, what do you do about access to data? Do you want to regulate access to data? How do you regulate it? So this is one of, uh, of the main issues. And some people, as indicated here, think that in future we'll just have a few platforms and, you know, like you will manufacture the product, but then there will only be a few platforms and all these platforms, these different uh, products and services will be marketed. So if that's the case. I mean, you don't want to have one, one single platform, that's for sure. You, need to, you want to have some competition. So the question is only, you know, how quickly is this going to develop and, and, and at what point as a regulator do you need to intervene? Then, uh, last but not least, there's obviously issues of financial stability uh, coming from different directions. One, obviously, is um, related um, uh, crypto assets, uh, the stable coins. Um, and that, that obviously is, uh, depends. I mean, uh, if it's a Bitcoin phenomenon, but for us, it was <coughs> more a question of uh, uh, consumer protection because it was relatively small in scale, so there wasn't really a financial stability issue. Obviously now, um, if you have uh, you want big data again coming in, like in, in Libra through Facebook, that obviously changes the game a bit. And, and you will have seen that there's a lot of discussion on what to, how to deal with this. If you suddenly have, have uh, stable coins and cryptocurrencies, to what extent will they challenge traditional currencies? Um, I must say, person, I'm very relaxed for currencies that work well could maybe be in, in, in other countries where, where there's a lot of volatility of the local currency. But still, there is a whole discussion. The question is, um, to what extent do our traditional rules apply and, you know, uh, financing, uh, terrorist financing, or all the compliant rules like money laundering, anti-money laundering, um, do they apply? Uh, what happens really if you know this kind of cryptocurrency comes in and the effect on monetary policy? Because potentially, obviously, uh, if really this is, is going to challenge the the, the, um, the um, currency as we know it, um, that can have uh, consequences, obviously, uh, on the action of of, of central banks uh, in terms of monetary policy. So these are things uh, that we that we we're following. Obviously, Libra is 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 one example. There will be others, but. Uh, where we need to decide where we want to go. Then one, one other big issue, which is um, more concrete, is obviously cyber risks. Um, 
that uh, you can see that on the chart that uh, obviously there are uh, risks and, and uh, intelligent risks in all sectors, but particularly high in, in, in finance and insurance. And so what I think what we need, uh, need to see is um, that uh, ICT security requirements um, are respected by, by the different market players. Um, uh, we understand from the advice that we got from the European Supervisory Authorities that it is an issue um, uh, where we're not there yet. So that's one of the things that one might uh, actually uh, think about regulation if necessary, because we want to make sure that there's, uh, there's a minimum um, of requirements on ICT security um, governance uh, in this area. Uh, given the significant risk that that poses, especially operational risk, but then obviously also risks to the financial stability. Then we have obviously the other question that, that um, was touched upon a bit uh, in the morning already uh, by Bloomberg on you know how quickly do markets behave on, on, on pieces of news that come in and, um, and the hurting behavior that that can create. So, um, and that's one issue where we already uh, regulated in, in MIFID uh, about high frequency trading so that we made sure that there has to be circuit breakers or you know, possibility of the market participants to stop the algorithm because at, at some point, you know, it's, if it goes really berserk, you need to be able to, to stop it. So that's, uh, I mean, that's one of the issues. The question is then obviously um, with these artificial applications, will this go further? Because some have the idea is that we can use that uh, not only for the high frequency trading, we'll use it uh, for dealings between banks, we're using it for, for, other, and for other counterparties. And then obviously <laughs> there's a bit of a risk because uh, if the algorithm then goes very fast, then you could even, for example, in extreme cases, front load solvency or, you know, you say, okay, there's a problem you have indicated to go in and that could then have uh, trigger reactions. So this is really a thing that, we, uh, that has to be uh, uh, watched. Um, on the other hand, obviously, data duration supervision can also help for financial stability if the supervisor is able to retrieve the right data overall better and more efficient from the system, so can maybe more easily detect systemic risk, but um, that uh, remains to be seen. Then, yeah, that's um, it's a variant, actually, and uh, a big discussion that uh, we have uh, also in other areas uh, today in, in, in Europe and the European Commission is about uh, what we call the, our autonomy, since uh, uh, we have to realize that a lot of uh, infrastructure that we're using, especially in financial services, is infrastructure that is not European. Um, so the question is to what extent, if you now have outsourced to a cloud, the cloud is then a, an operator from US or China normally, uh, is that a problem, or do we need to have, and this is a whole question of industrial policy, or, or do we need from a financial validity point of view, uh, you know, European clouds? And, and yes, uh, you know, it's this, this always the problem. Do we want to duplicate infrastructure? Is that efficient? On the other hand, maybe it's costly. On the other hand, maybe we want to have that to make sure that our data is, is safe here. So, and that's a, that's a general, a general debate that will, I think, continue for, um, for some time. Um, it's broader, obviously, than financial services, uh, especially recently, but, uh, but it also has an impact on, on, on financial services. So then, um, to sum up, you know, the policy implications, I mean, obviously you want to embrace and facilitate digital transformation also in the financial service area. Uh, in, in principle, we don't want um, to favor one technology over another, so I think as a regulator you should try to stay neutral as much as possible. You want to update and innovate and to promote that, develop skills. Um, but there's one thing, obviously, that you have to be careful, as I said before, is that if you have a digital transformation, um, you want that data standards and data standards are more or less um, uh, applied across the board, especially in Europe, but if possible even globally, and that data is shared. And uh, the question is how, this is also the, the level playing field issue I mentioned before, and it's also important obviously for the, for the Intel market to work. But, and as I said before, you obviously you have to, to mitigate the risks that you have for consumers, businesses and financial stability. So just to highlight uh, finally some of the, the big issues we had. Uh, yeah, data privacy, uh, data protection on the one hand, we have a new uh, data protection uh, law here in Europe, 
uh, to what extent uh, does this still work? Is it, uh, is it the right tool, actually, to make sure that data, customers' data is used as it should be? Then uh, I mentioned the level playing field. And as also within the level playing field, the issue, um, should you regulate activities of institutions? Because uh, as you know, at the moment, we rather regulate institutions, uh, banks, uh, funds, uh, insurance companies, and they also have, they all have different regulatory frameworks. Now the problem is the more, uh, but that's obviously <laughs> long-term vision, the more it comes together and the more you have similar products that are offered across the board, you might wonder whether it actually, you know, you shouldn't regulate more activities than the institutions. Although the institutions themselves obviously are, are different in a way and have different implications for customers and the stability. But it's, that's a question that obviously comes to mind. Again, supervisory oversight, we must make sure the supervisors can uh, keep pace. I think that's one of the, the, the key issues. Cyber resilience. And then, as I mentioned, uh, digital sovereignty. So I think we've got a lot of, uh, lot of issues on the plate here. Uh, I think it's fair to say that we're rather at the beginning now, uh, trying to understand. I mean, we had, as I said, MIFID, we had PSD2, so where we, at least for payment accounts, um, we try to make sure that there is uh, data on demand open um, uh, between uh, banks and, 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 and the new um, uh, companies coming in, be it uh, fintechs or big techs. Um, but uh, obviously a lot of issues are, are developing now and we have to see and to find the right moment uh, uh, to intervene if necessary. So I'm looking forward to learning a lot from this conference today uh, to know more about how we can best use our policy tools. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Klaus. Uh, as I said, the questions come later in the panel discussion. The next speaker is uh, Stefan Kern. Stefan Kern is Chief Economist and Head of Risk Analysis at the EU's Financial Markets Regulatory and Supervisory Authority, ESMA, in Paris, France. Appointed in 2012, he leads ESMA's analytical work on financial stability, market integrity and investor protection in securities and derivatives markets. The institutional investor industry as well as financial markets uh, in infrastructure of the European Union. He also oversees the authority statistical and data operations. Thank you, Stefan, for coming here. Please, the stage is yours. Thank you, Kai, for the very warm welcome, and thanks also to the Bank of Finland for inviting me to speak today. It's a great pleasure to be here, and in particular to represent the European Securities and Markets Authority, uh, i.e. the European Regulatory and Supervisory Authority that oversees Europe's capital markets, um, and therefore is very closely involved in the question of data <coughs> In general, as such, we have objectives of our own. Uh, financial stability is one of them, next to consumer protection and orderly markets. And uh, in that triangle, we need to look at exactly how data come into play and what use we can make of them. Let me, um, at this very beginning, uh, highlight that the views I'm presenting today are views of my own and uh, our authority and as experts, and of course do not necessarily rep represent uh, policy positions of the European Securities and Markets Authority. With these objectives in mind that we have, um, we of course have a strong interest in actually seeing and understanding exactly what is going on in financial markets in the European Union when it comes to data as well. Uh, we monitor the entire universe, in particular financial innovations, but in doing so and with respect to data, we focus on a few technologies that invariably have been mentioned to yesterday and today at this conference. First of all, big data. Second, uh, the processing of data through artificial intelligence, machine learning and deep learning. Um, third, uh, the storage and the processing of data, i.e. cloud computing and quantum computing. And finally, the decentralized processing of information and decision-making on that basis through distributed ledger technologies, in, com in particular in combination with self-enforcing contracts. So these are the main items that we look at when we monitor the overall data universe. In doing so, so I should mention at this point as well that uh, 
we pursue our financial stability objective, of course in cooperation with the other, other institutions and authorities in the European Union. So we work closely with the European Banking Authority, with, the, uh, with EOPA, the Insurance and Occupational Pensions Authority, and I think uh, Thomas uh, spoke yesterday, of course, with the European Systemic Risk Board in Frankfurt in order to understand exactly how it then pertains to financial stability. Now, in doing so, also at a, as a preliminary remi remark, we enter, of course, the game as regulators, supervisors with split personalities. First of all, we are ourselves generators of data. We have asked, together with policymakers, for more data. In the wake of the financial crisis, we asked for greater market transparency through MIFID, for example. Klaus, you mentioned it. We have a whole raft of reporting data, and I'll come to that point in a minute, uh, that I aim to produce to improve the oversight on our part of financial markets. And uh, their EMEA, SFT, RA, FMD are just uh, a few of the main buzzwords in the context. We use these data, and now comes the second uh, personality that we take, uh, in this game, we use this data in order to address our financial stability objectives and consumer prote protection objectives. We try to use them to analyze them and arrive at conclusions about what we believe are risks in the overall system. And then, of course, lastly, there is also the broader policy objective that the European Union has. Again, Klaus has already mentioned it. There is business promotion or the idea, at least, of being an, uh, a very open single market that uh, supports and facilitates financial innovation, generally speaking, and technology in particular. So this is a very wide angle that we take on these things. And just as wide as the angle it is that we have um, is the market that we oversee in this context that actually generates the data that we're talking about. Uh, just to give you a, a, a brief uh, ge uh, geographical and graphical expression of that, uh, we are in charge, so to say, of markets that extend into the trading world, for example, with over 30 trillion of market capitalization outstandings in the spot market, 660 trillion outstanding in derivatives markets, a whole raft of infrastructural institutions. Some of them are actually only in the market to produce market data, like trade repositories over which we have direct oversight. And then also institutional investors, which are both generators of large data sets, but also and primarily l users of large data sets, and who actually do employ many of the technologies that we look at. And if we try to get an overview over what exactly these financial institutions are doing these days, you can see that we are adopters, or our industries are adopters of the technologies and users of the technologies in order to handle the large data set that they, as financial service providers, actually produce and take advantage of. So, for example, uh, in the markets and infrastructures and, uh, and investors uh, uh, sections, you can see that many of the institutions that play a role in our markets are actually, first of all, pr um, producers of large, high-volume data sets, structured and unstructured, both. Uh, and many of them actually have a very high level of complexity that is being generated. In doing so, they actually then relate to the new technologies. Uh, it is our assessment. We don't have full uh, uh, details of oversight over the exact use of these technologies, but at the moment we assume that big data is a technology or, or a complex of technologies that almost all of the market participants in one way or another deploy to manage their resources. Uh, we also believe and see that is distributed ledger technologies are, at least in a piloting or in, in, in a general overview perspective, uh, tried out as a way of improving, especially back office functions, that also AI, ML and DL are being used in one way or another, especially in asset management, for example, but also by investment firms and securities trading as a means of becoming more, more efficient. The exact use of, da of cloud computing, we do not know. We don't have much information uh, as of yet, even though we're trying out. But the big message from this picture, from this uh, uh, very general picture, is that you know, there is a lot of financial market data in our, in our universe, and market participants are in the process of picking up the technologies that we're looking at. Whether they are particularly fast at it, that's a very interesting question. We, we have markets outside financial services which are m much more ingrained and, in, and, uh, and much more 
more uh, engaged in the use of these technologies, but it is a uh, technological development that is certainly in full pace. What we take along from our perspective um, is that we look at roughly five broad trends about the future of data and finance. And the first of, of it is actually a moot point, but it needs to, made, to be made. There will be, in all likelihood, much more data in our universe, uh, in the financial services. With higher granularity, it will be more data-driven uh, in the business uh, decisions, but also in the regulatory sphere. And there is a much stronger trend towards the efficiency use of data and the processing of it, for example, through cloud services. Second, all of that will make our financial services much faster acceleration of the business will come from more efficient sales and trading practices, from faster trading decisions, uh, and all of that backed up by much, much faster and potentially more precise analytics in the background. Third, it, we were facing a, an era of rising automization of decision-making. We have AI, artificial intelligence, and machine learning as the key drivers in the background. All of that backed up uh, potentially with self-enforcing contracts uh, to the point that it is actually the machines that decide in many uh, instances and the humans only set the parameters of the business in total. <clears throat> Fourth point, and almost inev inevitably com coming out of it, we face a much higher complexity of financial services going forward. Machines find out much more complex patterns of interaction in the industry there will be new data-driven financial market activities in products, and we can already, we already see it. Um, Klaus pointed to them, crypto assets, stable coins, DLT-based infrastructures, and so on. And all of them raise very fundamental questions from a policy perspective. And finally, uh, especially as regulators, supervisors, we need to be aware of that. We also have certainly a question of a dash for resources in the sense that uh, these technologies are highly resource intensive, both in terms of capital, but also in human resources. And uh, that is a very competitive, competitive factor in the financial system. The risks that we see in all this can be grouped. I mean, you know, you can deploy all sorts of categorizations around this game, and I'm trying to group this around three main themes. First of all, it comes with a rise in interconnectedness and uh, potential for greater contagion in the financial industry from our perspectives. <clears throat> this has to do a lot with the rise in correlations, uh, new correlations which are either factual because there are new correlations for new financial services and new players, but also through the detection of, of patterns in the first place. So we see and uncover new correlations that in the past we just weren't aware of, even though they might, might have existed. And in addition to that, the propagation of volatility by shared algorithms, for example, or similar machine learning patterns might actually come in as an amplifying factor. A second group of risks is centers around market credit and liquidity. Uh, there, the main sources of the vulnerabilities come from, first of all, the homogeneity that is created through machine learning in the market, uh, and that might lead to, lead to at least similar investment and lending patterns, uh, and their directional trading is a key buzzword that we have. Second, we are concerned about rising uncertainty in the markets, because uh, especially in the case of black box style, artificial intelligent instruments, uh, there will be a lower predictability of market developments. And uh, what comes on top is at least a concern of the fact that uh, if more efficient arbitrage through the, uh, through the use of data might actually lead to an optimization, positively speaking, but with that also a lower level of capital margins and liquidity in financial market, uh, in financial market uh, participants. And that is, of course, a great concern for us because we are very interested in sufficient cu cushions to, uh, to do the business. Finally, the whole complex of our operational risks. First of all, data in the, uh, themselves might uh, not be of the le right level of quality or of an unknown provenience, and that is something that can distort the outcomes, especially when it comes to automated decision-making further down the road. Second, come all the model risks. Now, I'm sure yesterday you've had a chance to go through some of the um, worries that uh, uh, market participants, users of uh, 
new models actually have around these points. And uh, where the buzzword these days is explainable artificial intelligence, i.e. the ability to actually understand what the algorithms do. An additional point is, uh, in this game is the technology itself, i.e. the rising dependence on, uh, on the technology, and with that, inversely, the vulnerability to system downs wherever they may come from in some form or another. And let me finally also highlight a thing, I think we had it yesterday over, over dinner, uh, we considered that point, the reputational factor. Stability impact that might rise from a loss of trust in data. You know, in financial services, we are used to losses of trust in financial market participants. When a bank goes down, and confidence is lost in the financial institution, we are used to solving the problem by throwing money at it. And sooner or later, we hope, and in most cases, confidence comes back. The dynamics in data might be different if a large data service provider has lost the trust of the users. It is far from clear whether throwing money at the problem actually solves this, right? So this is the, dynamic of a, uh, the dynamics of a potential uh, contingency situations might be different in the data universe and in the information universe than they might be in the classical banking or financial services universe. Now, we as authorities, of course, are amongst the primary beneficiaries of, new, of, of the data sets. As we had it in the beginning, we are now commanding a whole raft of new data sources from the regulation. I mentioned uh, already MIFID II for, tra for transparency requirements, email for derivatives data in future securities, finance, and transactions, a very important piece. That has uh, put us in an unprecedented uh, p position to actually analyze and understand what is going on. And in a tragic way, it is, you know, if you compare it to the post-crisis uh, situation, it has brought us from being totally out in the dark to now being blinded by the light. Of course, we've got so, many so much data, such an ocean of data that going fishing and r uh, spotting exactly the right risks and vulnerabilities has become a challenge in and by itself. And as data users, of course, we try to set our priorities here. We have a uh, um, pretty massive data operation in-house uh, processing, for example, around uh, the MIFID complex, four billions of records and more than 60 millions of transactions. On each iteration, we do the transparency calculations and we produce more than 26 billion of derivatives trading records into the system and actually process them, and in order to control that, we use machine learning to do the quality control of those data, and quality control is a very big issue that we have, no doubt. By the way, a very important point to notice about this one, the data that we use and transform, for example, in the MIFID context on trading through the transparency requirements themselves, then enter the output that we do, the thresholds for transparency requirements, then are brought back to the markets and market participants use these data and ingrain them themselves into their own systems. So the data is not only used by us, but also given back in a distilled form to the market participants and they then hardwire them into their systems, which of course you know, brings in an entirely new loop of interaction and interconnectedness in the system, which is overall brought us to a position where we uh, can now actually analyze these data in a, very, in a very productive way for the markets themselves, but also an informative way when it comes to financial stability. And uh, I included in the slides, uh, you might uh, want to take a look at it, three cases where you can see our concrete use of the data. The first one is the analysis of derivatives markets that we do for the European Union on the ba basis of email data. And we report on this analysis in our annual, annual statistical report, the next one coming up um, on the 11th of December for the year 2019, where we do some complex analysis. The second one is around alternative investment funds, better known or part of it as hedge funds, where we can look at portfolios of uh, alternative investors of quite some magnitude and report the, uh, at that too at an annual level. And finally, uh, as an example of uh, the matching of data, matching being data, ma data system matching being one of the big tasks that we have as regulators to connect the dots between the user derivatives on the one hand and by, for example, institutional investors and what risks do they build up in their own portfolios as a third case study which we are publishing on a regular basis in our Trends, Risks and Vulnerabilities report. Um, our outlook on uh, this matter is as follows. 
First of all, uh, we need to keep an eye uh, and prioritize our data policy and da data supervision. I hope maybe that yesterday I didn't have a chance to listen to all the discussions that you had, but I hope that data standardization played some form of role, because at the end of the day, without a minimum level of standardization, many of the data sets don't make sense, and the standardization facilitates their use, even though we fully understand that, of course, machine learning algorithms might get over it and help us, you know, for non-standardized data to better understand them. But at the end of the day, especially in finance, the introduction of the ISIN, of the legal entity identifier, of the GLIFE, the global legal identifier, unique transaction uh, uh, identifiers, and so on, ISO standards, is key to an efficient use of those data and benefits all of us in the room who actually use the data. Second, uh, we need to fulfill our supervisory mandate, for example, on trade repositories, i.e. these institutions whose only job it is to collect data, and to make sure that the quality of the data output, for example, on derivatives is sufficient to our standards, and that is a big struggle. And then finally, uh, we also advise the policy process, of course, on some of the technological pro progress th that occurs and the challenges that come in and, uh, and try and provide perspectives, particularly from capital markets, on these technologies. The second one is on big data implementation. Of course, a regulator, supervisor like us, would also want and wish to, be, to have big data capabilities because it would you know, get us uh, a long way into understanding the very complex data sets that we have. Uh, derivatives is one example, and in the future it will be securities financing transactions with multidimensional sets of data going on. At the same time, the reality is, if you look at ESMA, for example, 90% of the data that we command is actually structured conventional data that we at the moment can still handle with quite conventional R and Python programming and coding. And we need to weigh as an institution, as a regulator supervisor, the capital expenses and the human resource expenses that we would need as a, if we wanted to acquire big data capacities, uh, we would need to weigh them against alternative and reasonable other users that can be made with these data. Third point is so we need to develop advanced analytics. We are right in the middle of it. The publications, the annual statistical reports, the trends, the risks and vulnerabilities report pay tribute to, you, to that. I can only recommend you take a look at these documents and you see all the efforts that we make also with respect to the buzzwords like uh, natural language processing and AIML. All of them are being used when we produce our analysis. And then finally, data-driven regulation and convergence and supervision. We are very concerned to bring all the national authorities also onto one uh, sheet uh, and one perspective on the use of these technologies and the way they treat market participants. And uh, to that end, we are very engaged in actually producing joint key performance indicators, key risk indicators that then help national authorities in the European Union to oversee the market, to control the market and their, and their participants and make it better on them and easier on them to exercise their supervisory functions. And those five points, four points here on the, uh, on the outlook side are the priorities for us in the years going forward. Of course, that is not a guarantee. This is a fast-moving environment. The technology evolves uh, very critically, and uh, it might be that we see additional changes and additional challenges that uh, bring us to the point that we rebalance our portfolio. But overall speaking, uh, especially the policy side, and uh, developing our own capacities in this, uh, in this world and against the background of the large data sources that we have is a priority for us going forward. And we look forward to continuing our dialogue, like I said, with, our, um, with the other regulators, supervisors, with the central banks, but also with market participants in getting better at using these data. With that, I hand it back to Kai, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for that uh, very timely and concise uh, uh, introduction to the panel discussion. Uh, but before we go to the panel discussion, we have one more uh, presentation. It's Heli Koski, who is research director uh, for the Research Institute of the Finnish Economy at, at Aalto University. Heli Koski is a PhD in economics. 
uh, is a research director at Atlas Growth International Trade and Competition Research Program and research director at Alta University responsible for the strategic research program Disruptive Technologies and Changing Institutions of the Academy of Finland. Her recent research has focused on data economy, competition and economic analysis of innovation and business strategies. Thank you, Heli, for coming here. The floor is yours. So thanks for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to be here. So here you can see the uh, title of my talk, Data Giants in Finance and uh, Reshaping the Industry. So uh, this, is, this was the news which was maybe the most uh, important one shaking the uh, financial industry this year. The announcement that uh, Facebook would uh, establish its own currency, Libra. Well, we don't know yet which, whether this is going to happen, but uh, at least uh, it made incumbents and central banks to think very hard the future of the financial sector and whether they should maybe establish their own uh, digital currencies. So, but I'm not going to talk about Libra or that. I, uh, what, it, what I'm going to talk about is basically uh, to look at the, uh, how these data giants have gotten, look at the kind of footprint of the data giants when they have been entering the uh, uh, finance industry. And this I'm going to use uh, data of the innovation and uh, of the acquisition of uh, new companies and financial sector. And then last, I will talk about the, uh, the role of data giants uh, and financial services market now, and a little bit about the, the impact on competition and future. So here we can see, uh, when we look at the innovation, this is the R&D expenditures of six large uh, technology companies in the United States. And I'm sorry, I can now see that the, uh, the left vertical side title is missing. It's supposed to be represent the uh, U.S. dollars million R&D of each of these uh, bulks, which are the, so company-wise R&D, and then the line there is the, the total R&D, which is on the right uh, vertical axis. So as you can see, there has been a in huge increase since 2010 in the R&D investments. So especially uh, in, uh, if you look at Amazon or Alphabet or Google. And now you can see that uh, it is more than tenfold than it was 2010 when it was less than 10 uh, million, uh, no, 10 billion US dollars. Now it's close to 100 billion to dollars in total. And if you think about a small country like Finland, we are really tiny compared to each of them except maybe IBM that uh, we have our total R&D expenditures, including all the firms, universities, research institutes, so on, it's less than seven billion US dollars. That put, uh, put this picture on the scale. So, but now let's look at um, uh, the patents and why we look at the patents here. Uh, what they have been doing in, uh, in terms of patenting is that, first of all, the patents, they provide the, uh, the holder, the right the kind of monopoly right for the, typically for 20 years, to exclude others from making, using, or selling invention. So basically, this is a, this is a tool uh, they use when they compete for the market. So you can support creation of or entry to new market, and via patenting, you can, uh, or firm can, uh, secure that it will have in the future freedom to commercially exploit its ideas in new expanding uh, market areas. Okay, patents are used for other purposes. They're for, used for cross-licensing, licensing, in patenting disputes. You can also uh, use patent portfolios to block follow and innovation and so on. But in any case, we, you know, firms do not know actually how the markets will evolve. So uh, if you see that in, there's an uh, increase in a uh, certain technology field, in patenting, at, at least you can get the hunch that uh, there are firms are expecting that 
these markets are, there will be go, going to be a growing importance for these markets in the future. Okay, so let's look at, this is not a data giants, but this is all over, this is the patenting of the uh, artificial intelligence domain and uh, fintech domain uh, patent applications filed at, with the USPTO. And how I define here artificial intelligence and fintech domains is there have been some studies. They have been looking at the international patent classification and defined classes of technologies belonging, which are representing these, these um, technology, technologies. And why USPTO? Well, it's the biggest market area, and also software is patentable there, unlike in Europe. So we, when you look at this picture, you can see that, okay, there has been not that much activity in 2005 yet, but huge increase, exponential increase in 2011. At, and at least to me, I was quite surprised because I was expecting that artificial intelligence patenting would have been increased more than uh, patents in the fintech domain. But it's the opposite, which, which, is, uh, which tells about the uh, importance of the fintech sector. So then if we look at the, uh, the patenting of these uh, five technology giants, uh, the red, uh, blue bulk is the patenting applications uh, from 2005 to 2010. And as you can see, except Microsoft, they have not been doing much in terms of patenting uh, until 2011. And again, there's a huge increase, especially if you look at the Google. It has filed more than 200 patent applications in this field between 2011 and 2017. And also, Facebook has been coming into the game. But Facebook was not patenting almost at all in this field uh, before 2011, but now there was more than 50 patent, patents filed uh, after 2011. Uh, I think, again, the change is even more dramatic in, the, in terms of the artificial inter intelligence patents and also the scale. There was, we were talking about 200 patents Less, more than 200 patents there uh, for Google. And now you can, we are talking about more than 500 patents between 2011 and 2017. And especially Google is the one which has increased patenting, as well as Facebook. Facebook didn't patent at all in this field uh, before 2011. So these guys are really, you can see it from this kind of footprint in, of their patenting, how, when they have started to come, when they have started to realize the importance of these uh, technologies for their business. Uh, what about acquisitions? Uh, this is the picture of the uh, data giants acquisitions uh, overall. They acquired in total more than 700 companies between 2005 and 2018. And Google did more than 200 acquisitions. That's a huge number. And this is to look at the kind of uh, get the idea oops, uh, whether to what extent the companies have been patenting in the uh, no patenting sorry acquiring uh, companies in the core market area. And core market area here is defined such that uh, this acquired company is producing uh, products in one of the core business categories of the acquirer, the data giants. Otherwise, it's non-core market area. And as you can see here, Google is leading here. It has, it has been acquiring uh, almost 70% of its acquisitions have been outside the core market area. So it has been entering, basically, the new markets via, via the acquisitions. And if we look at more details about, about the numbers of fintech and uh, artificial intelligence acquisitions, we get the can, same kind of story as we get from the patenting. Not that much, except, okay, maybe fintech, there was uh, more applications, but uh, they have really started as well as patenting uh, since 2011 in these areas. The acquisitions have increased. And this picture gives you the share of these companies, large companies, like what is the share of each of the companies in, in the all acquisitions, those 700, then artificial in the 
intel intelligence and data analytics companies and financial services companies. As you can see, okay, as I said, in all acquisitions, Google is leading, but it's also leading in the uh, acquisitions of financial services firms. Whereas Apple has not acquired any the, any firm which is categorized as uh, being uh, in financial services. Uh, uh, AI and data analytics is more equally divided, but you can see, see that maybe Apple and Google are a bit, bit like leaders in this uh, category. So what does it mean? Okay, no, I have this example of cover buyouts here. These are like a, what kind of companies they have bought in financial sector uh, previously. And unfortunately, often they don't announce the price. So for, for these three, uh, we know only price of the one, one which is the, the Facebook's bought out uh, on Apple. And all these companies, bought Google, Facebook, and Amazon, they were less than six years old, so they can regard it as startups. And you can see, you, you probably read it already, that uh, you can get the kind of hunch what kind of business they are interested in. But we don't know really what is the underlying reason for they bought, buy exactly this kind of business. So uh, the question here is that, uh, we can ask, is it, good if they, is, it, is it really bad or good if they acquire these companies? And we don't know because uh, uh, it depends. On the other hand, we know that these data giants, they have, they have huge capabilities, they have a lot of knowledge, they have a lot of uh, money to, uh, when, they, when they access new technologies and that knowledge, they, it increases their specialization maybe in the new area. And if they are better because of their scale and their capabilities to exploit uh, these technologies that have been developed by innovative startups, well, that might be good. We can get efficiency gains, uh, we can get increased innovation, we can get more welfare. But on the other hand, if these are so-called killer acquisitions, so these data giants bought them out because exactly because of their innovative cap capabilities, because they are threat, because they, you, they know that they can scale up potentially uh, their business very fast and will pr produce a substantial threat, competitive threat to them uh, later in, in, the, um, in these markets. And okay, they buy them out just to cut the competition. And they then maybe even not use the uh, technolo in, uh, innovations they have been uh, producing. So in that case, this is bad. So it decreases competition. It may uh, increase barriers to entry. There's antitrust concerns and so on. So if we look at now the uh, what is the uh, status of uh, data giants in the financial markets at the moment and uh, about more where they entered and how they might affect competition is like first there's one picture of digital disruption in financial markets. We can see that uh, these brick and mortar branches, the numbers have been decreasing both in the United States and in Europe. Well, it used to be at least in Finland some 30, 40 years ago that if you wanted to have a loan in the bank, you really have to go to back with, the, with your hat in your hand to the bank that, and have a discussion personally with the uh, the leader of the bank, and then if you if you get an agreement and you get the loan, then you in Finland at least they we used to have a or they used to have a have a cup of coffee and a bun after to kind of seal the deal, <laughs> but it was very difficult. I mean, many Finnish people are very shy, so it was really a stressful process. So I think they are really happy with these new fintech unicorns in Europe, which are purely providing uh, online services. You don't have to go to the bank; you just can online type your application and uh, get the answer very fast and so on. But this has changed a lot, as, as was talked uh, in previous talks. This has changed the, uh, the landscape in the financial services a lot. And now we also have the, uh, in this ecosystem, the data giants. So basically how they, the, the, uh, the first uh, services they were providing, 
uh, where uh, these kind of uh, digital wallets, Apple Pay, Google Pay, where the users were able to get the, get the uh, they were basically using the online third-party payment infrastructures, which were uh, handling uh, credit card or retail payment systems and processing uh, the payments and settlements. And then there was another form, another time, where these payments and settlements were handled in these proprietary payment systems established. Okay, I have to rush, I see. So they also, okay, they, went, they have been providing insurance products, fin uh, loans and so on, for instance, Amazon. But this mostly has been because of the, uh, Amazon wants to support its uh, own e-commerce. They want to uh, decrease the frictions in the buying and selling, increase buyers and sellers and platform. And we haven't yet seen large companies to enter traditional banking. And still, these financial services generate only a small part of their revenues, but they, are, they do look new areas to enter. So if we look at briefly the pros and cons of data chain entry, well, there are first questions of efficiency, competition, data regulations, uh, but also, as was taught before, these data giants, they can provide efficiency. They can provide new services and products. Uh, they can have enhanced financial inclusions because they serve some clients that uh, they are not served by the incumbents before. So they, they, can be, they can be good as well. And why they are so good is that they have technologies to understand uh, customer needs. These are the titles of some patents filed by the data giants. You can see that they, can, they have been uh, developing technologies to pick up the mood, to use behavioral information, to determine a user interest from non-explicit clues, estimate user attention, uh, and so on. So they can provide customer experience. They can use data to offer personalized services, unlike the incumbents at the moment, at least. Digital assistance offers recommendations. On the other hand, they can extract trends also via data. They can price discriminate, so they can use the data to identify the maximum the consumers are willing to pay. So they can basically switch consumer welfare or consumer sur surplus to their own profits. So it's not good for consumers in that respect. So, so is, is this... Uh, if there's more liberal market entry, is that good? Typically, yes, it is, because it fosters competition. But in case of data giants, because they are large, they have control over various digital platforms, they have massive amounts of data. This can, may enable them to use market power also in finance. And, okay, we don't know, but it's a possibility that uh, they end up behaving anti-competitively. So, exclusionary practices. For instance, they can, they can increase user switching costs. This has been seen, for instance, that if you buy apps from the Apple, you can't use them in Android environment. That's one example. Uh, they can use self-preferencing. They can favor own products. Well, for instance, they can make competing financial companies access to client where they own platforms more expensive. And there are a lot of these kind of ex ex examples of self-preferencing in, uh, in, in the literature. Uh, and they can uh, kill their competitors. Also, there's a possibility that they abuse their dominant position. Uh, there's a lot of debate whether the, the data available to dominant firm but not competitors is regarded as an abuse of dominant position, but whether it should be opened up. But I think we might discuss this about uh, later in the uh, panel. And there are a lot of other anti-competitive practices uh, Algorithm collusion was already mentioned in the previous talk and so on. But, okay, we, what we know at least now is that the entry to finance continues. We have seen these credit card launches of Amazon and Apple, uh, Facebook new payment system, face, Facebook Pay. And finally, we got the news this uh, November that Google will be offering checking accounts in the US in 2020. So it's going now to the traditional banking, as we saw that it, was, it has been investing so heavily, patenting, acquisitions, and so on. And now it's going to be there in tra traditional banking. And well, this is at least what the uh, 
Economist of November 21st claims, they are after your data, not your money. I'm not sure so certain anymore after this move of Google to the traditional banking, but could be true. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heli. Uh, this was a really good uh, complement to, to, the, to the more financial uh, regulatory speeches before. Um, now, please, uh, come, if you come up, um, Klaus and Stefan. And uh, today we have also Alexi Grimm from um, uh, Bank of Finland moderating this panel discussion. He will start with uh, asking uh, the panel discussion uh, himself some questions, and then afterwards the question will be open to the audience. But he will manage this session. Thank you for coming, Alexi. Thank you very much. So this is the last session of the, of the conference, and the topic is future of financial stability. So let's try to kind of wrap up and, and summarize um, not only your um, uh, very nice presentation that we just heard, but everything we've been hearing throughout the conference um, and tying it back to, back to financial stability. So in other words, how the proliferation of AI, big data, and, and so on is changing how we think about financial stability um, and risks on a, on a macro level, basically. And of course, as, as regulators and central banks, what we're trying to do is sort of prevent the concentration of risks um, and supervise too big to fail um, institutions and make sure that uh, the risks don't spill over into the real economy. So that's, that's sort of the goal. And um, I think we, we will divide this conversation into three different parts. So let's, let's start with just painting the landscape one more time. Um, and we can, you know... Um, take ideas from, from all, the, all the presentations we've been hearing. So with the market participants and the, let's say, the, the banks and the funds and the, the financial industry um, taking advantage of new technologies, AI and big data, um, so what, what, sort of, what sort of financial industry and financial market are we looking at in the future? What are, what are some of the defining features um, going forward in the next 10 years? How would you how would you summarize this question? If you can, yeah. Um, I think you know the main uh, forces drivers were discussed uh, at length in our presentations. Um, Healy mentioned it um, in uh, in detail. There is a strong drive towards concentration because there is a strong logic for economies of scale in handling data. Mm -hmm. And uh, with the big tech firms, we've got companies whose interest is at least on both sides, right? I mean, it's, it's really interesting whether it's for the data or for the, for, for the money or both. Uh, that's probably a moot point, and these guys will need to figure it out for themselves, and that might take some time. But what 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 adds to this dynamic is simply the fact that you have very potent players uh, that are experts in handling with data and they're moving into an industry which uh, for 5000 years has mainly been about processing information that is what finance is about right and uh, and so this is going to be a very interesting mix like i say i mean that that trend is about economies of scale right and then at the same time uh, i understand analysts project that there will always be a lot of space for boutique niche specialist providers of services that uh, then occupy and enter a market that would not be classified or in, in some way occupied by the more standardized services that the bulk providers would actually then cover. What I find very interesting is the question of <clears throat> to what extent the new technologies will actually enable um, even the large participants to go beyond offering to clients standardized products, which is the, the big promise, of course, of the, of the scale business, right? So you get standardized products and you offer them. But actually, just because these, uh, these products can be more intelligent in the future, to actually go and at a very large level also provide tailor-made solutions. Mm -hmm. 
So this specialization and actually going after the individual client's needs, that is a thing I understand that is discussed, for example, I mean, Matt couldn't make it here, but uh, in their preparatory meetings for Davos uh, two, three weeks ago in Dubai, there was a, a big discussion around the, the possibility of the new technologies enabling even large market providers to tailor make products to the individual person. I mean, generally products, but also financial products to the individual person. And that is, uh, might be very exciting middle ground. Mm -hmm. Heli, any thoughts? Yeah, I pretty much agree everything with you said. But on the other hand, if you look at Europe, the, uh, the degree of concentration of the markets in finance, it varies a lot in Europe. And it seems that it has been, concentration has been declining in the UK, but whereas in the Nordic countries it's pretty high. Of course, the tide could turn. But I think it now depends on the balance between how these uh, new fintech companies are evolving. And now we see this, for in, many of them are UK-based, actually, these, these unicorns. Mm -hmm. And if they can scale up instead of the, uh, the data giants, then I think, as we have seen these developments of decreasing uh, concentration, it is also possible that uh, the tide, tide is turning. But on the other hand, another mark about concentration, it's not bad as such. Because uh, if it brings efficiency to the markets, uh, if it doesn't involve uh, abuse of market power, then it's only good. So it's basically the question of if we have these big platforms in the end, it's about the regulation of these platforms <coughs> properly. Yes, it could be seen as a, as a natural development. We talked about scale. Yes. Um, Any thoughts, Klaus? Yeah, so, I mean, for us... Um, the question will be also, I mean, we're watching this and some of what we hear today, we don't necessarily see it on the ground completely on financial services yet. I mean, if you look at the banking thing, I mean, you see fintechs are coming in, but they're coming in uh, on certain, as you said, certain niche issues for the moment. Yeah. So the core banking business, um, we'll see, I, I see the Google apparent is coming in now in the US. Mm -hmm. We'll see that. We don't see that that much yet in the, in, the, in the European landscape. And obviously, if you come in, that means that European legislation will apply to you immediately. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In, depending on what you do. And, 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 and the question is, to what extent and how quickly will they do this, this job now, for example, in, if you look at the banking services? Huh? So uh, we're watching that, but that, that there are two things. One is obviously there's a different, I mean, you come in, it's like in other industries, you come in with big data and a lot of expertise on one hand, but there's another expertise, obviously, which is linked to uh, you know, risk management, uh, things like that, that's really core business. Okay, to what extent, uh, you know, what, who will win the race and, and will the incumbents then uh, also try to, to do catch up. So I think that's the thing that we still have to be, we'll still be seen. No? So if I try to summarize, there is this competitive aspect. So there are the incumbent players, but there's also new entrants into the market. But many of the methods and technologies we've been talking about the last two days also being used and harnessed by the incumbent players, by the banks and, and, and funds and market participants. And you know, a lot of the trading and financial in intermediation has been done. Do, we're doing it in a different way, maybe in the future. Mm -hmm. I think the key question for both of these dynamics, the competitive aspect, but also using new technology is, will this take us towards a more stable financial landscape or a less stable financial landscape? Any thoughts on this? I think I'd, I'd try to touch upon this already a bit in my presentation. I mean, th that's obviously uh, looking forward uh, has advantages to a certain extent that uh, uh, you can get and you you do accumulate more and, and better data. So if you mm -hmm. if you if you manage really to <laughs> to handle the data in in in, in, in the right way, I suppose then you can have a better picture of of how the markets are moving, and also they will also benefit obviously for financial stability. It's maybe more for you too. <laughs> well, I mean, one of the uh, one of the distinguishing aspects in, in this discussion is that what we fear most when it comes to financial stability is the unknown, right? I mean, when uh, we look at, and this um, also is a result of uh, several hundreds of years of financial crisis and instability. Uh, we've uh, each time with uh, an irregularity, if not a crisis, we've gotten better at identifying um, system aspects and system vulnerabilities um, as they occurred. But then what happened next was, m was mainly 
a, in, in the next uh, iteration of crisis, there was then a new sort of market that came our way. And in the financial crisis, it was a lot about the interaction of, on the one hand, liberal credit markets, like, you know, subprime on the one hand, and on the other hand, the use and, and increasing widespread use of derivative instruments, in particular credit default swaps. So that was a new element. And really there, people just weren't aware exactly what was going on. And here we are exactly in a pretty much the same situation. We have a new aspect that is A, the rising uh, relevance and importance of data, the entry of new incumbents, the production of new products, so actually many facets to the whole game, and really we have uh, not a very intense impression of how that could f unfold in, uh, in a critical situation. And let's be clear, uh, our financial system is at the current stage not at a, at a moment of strength, right? We are still in a very vulnerable environment. Uh, in a period of zero, if not negative, interest rates, European banks are, you know, not really at the peak of their strengths as well. So if you take the whole picture together, um, uh, you, you are operating in a pretty complex, la uh, complex landscape. We just need to get much better at understanding what this whole data business means, where the interconnections are and where the vulnerabilities are. And this is the job we're doing right at the moment. Yeah. Any additional thoughts, Ellie? I have not much to add for this, but I think it's also, um, if you think about artificial intelligence, and the problem is now uh, we don't really understand how it functions. There are a lot of uncertainties related to it. And I think one of the biggest thing is uh, to understand how we can, uh, or how those who use artificial intelligence, how they teach algorithms to avoid this kind of pro-cyclical behavior or that these examples that if everyone is using the same type of algorithm is the uh, uh, trading stocks for instance and it seems that they are pretty good when in the short term like within a day they balance the things but then when we um, when we look at the if there are big news or shock to the system they start to behave in the same way kind of like raising like um, kind of um, going to, towards this kind of pro-cyclical behavior and crash towards crashes. So I think this is the one question which has to be solved in the future to uh, avoid uh, the big crashes and risks. Yes, I mean, we have seen unintended consequences like flash crashes in, in mm. the stock market or... Um, or credit decisions by by um, you know, Apple Card and so on. We've we've heard about these cases. So I guess it's it's a balance between you know, we're getting more data to better understand how the markets are operating. But at the same time, when the market participants are using that data and they're using technology, the market also becomes more complex. So and that brings me to the sort of second point of view to to the overall question of financial stability. So. What sort of tools and methods do I, as a regulator and as a central bank, have at my disposal now that I didn't have before? So is my work going to become easier or more difficult? Difficult in the sense that I have a more complex landscape to manage, easier because I have more tools available. Yeah, I mean, from the Commission's point of view, obviously we're a more high-level regulator. Um, uh, it's getting more complex, that's for sure. And the question is, uh, at what time do you come in? As, as I said, I mean, the presentation, um, there are these competition issues that, that have been uh, you know, highlighted. Um, I mean, you don't want to uh, kind of uh, stall progress at the one hand. On the, one. On the other hand, uh, the, there's probably a moment where you would have to make sure that uh, this transformation, if it takes place, we'll see how quickly it will be, um, go, is in a way, goes in a way that, you know, there is, um, fair competition and, and equal access to, to this data. If you really go towards a situation where some say that we have you know, several platforms only that will then basically uh, distribute the products, I think here um, we will have, to, will have to come in and it will be much more difficult huh? because you will need to know at what point you really need to regulate. You don't want to over-regulate either. So I think for us uh, it's, it's, it's getting more complex. No? Mm -hmm. Definitely thoughts. Klaus, you, 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 um, in, in your own presentation, you mentioned one very interesting example that, that, that speaks to the tool question, that is high-frequency trading, right? Uh, and the way in the past 20, 25 years we dealt with high-frequency trading, I mean, not, not even high-frequency trading. If we look at um, 
a market crash. It's now 30, 32 years back, I think 19th of, of October 1987, that we saw the first electronically induced market crash in the United States, 22% in one day, right? Um, so, and, and this is 32 years now, right? Um, so this has a long story. In the meantime, a lot has happened. Everything is, uh, is now electronic in the order book. We have high frequency trading. We have um, co-location as, as an amplifying factor. Um, did policymakers, regulators go at really understanding, analyzing, controlling algorithms in that period? Mm -hmm. Answer no. Probably it would have been impossible, right? Um, and, and maybe it is right and realistic that we never had the ambition of controlling everything that uh, a trader codes in the back office of his, uh, of his uh, London or New York or wherever office. Uh, um, but what we did is devise effective tools in stopping the potential impact. Mm -hmm. In this case, circuit breaker. These days we are discussing speed bumps, for example, in, uh, in trading venues um, and, 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 and trying to explore the efficiency of these instruments. So we try to control or, and have tools to intervene in moments when the effects of a certain development sets in and then handle the situation effectively. And I think this is the sort of spirit in which uh, many in the regulatory and supervisory community look at, at these phenomena. We don't need to control and understand everything that is going on, but we need to be able to act effectively when something happens and have tools in place that uh, can, even in, on, on run rate, try and dampen certain developments. And that's, that, that is sort of spirit that we take. Yeah, good point. Have you anything yeah, to I add? Think, uh, one point about the, you said that equal access to data would be important. I think we have to be really careful about these questions because uh, it depends really uh, how important access to data is for competition, whether they're regulated, and it depends on what type of data we are talking about. Is it personal data? Is it non-personal data? Uh, what are the market circumstances? Are, are this really, uh, is this really this market character such that uh, data access is necessary for the competition, as has been taught in uh, the context of PSD2. If not, we may not need this kind of regulation. And it, it could be a sector-specific question, but it also could be data-specific question. And then there are, of course, there is a public sector data, which is now regulated, or there is a PSC directive, which is basically saying that all the public data, which is funded by public uh, money, is basically should be available for everyone. But, uh, but then another uh, point comes from the competition point of view is that uh, uh, this requirement of the uh, all data being uh, available for everyone is that there are some restrictions in the competition laws. And it's like business secrets. You can't really uh, say that, peop uh, that the, uh, those data which can be regarded business secrets should be allocated to everyone. And it's very good, difficult to define what is this kind of data, actually. Yeah, yeah but this is an issue that we have to define that, because if everything is business secret, then, you know. Mm. But that's okay, that's, a, that's where you have it, uh, the limits of, of, of competition. Yeah. 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 And when I think about the, the toolkits, sort of what, what are the additional tools that um, a financial stability regulator has at their disposal? I mean, there's, there's data, you need data on the one hand, but you also need algorithms, technologies, you know, um, ways to analyze and, and use that data. I, I, have a, I have a gut feeling if I talk to any vendor of these, these and tools and products, they will, you know, of course say that they have you know, great predictive power and it gives me, you know, makes my work so much easier. Um, at the same time, I think it came through in, in, in a number of the presentations is that you need, you need an enormous amount of data until uh, you know, before, before some of the AI methods really become effective. And maybe from a regulator point of view, I'm still kind of asking the question, are the, all of these tools really predictive or are they really just a bit more descriptive than the tools we previously had? Maybe coming back to the, to can we prevent crisis? Probably not, but you know, do we get real predictive power out of, out of AI? from a financial stability point of view? Now for us, I think maybe more for the supervisors, but, but I think what, what is important is that 
you understand the outcome. I don't think as a supervisor you need to know obviously every little thing. I mean, the more you know, the better it is. But you have to be able to check that the outcome, that you know, whatever algorithm is there, comes there, for example, for the model of a bank, whether this one is, is plausible and, and adequately captures risk or not. I'm not sure that we can we can strive to understand all the different algorithms that are in the system. Exactly, that's okay. the point. I mean, at the end of the day, understanding everything. I mean, th th that sets in when you get into a forensic situation. Something has happened, and then you need to do ex post forensics. What exactly has happened to figure out the legalities? Right there, we need the capacities, and we do have the capacities to do these things on a predictive basis. Of course, it's very difficult, and I understand for also from the discussion that I hear we're having in in this conference. So when we look at artificial intelligence, not, it's actually, that's a buzzword, the, the machine learning part of it, right? Um, I still understand that, that we're in a phase of the black box, right? And that uh, uh, on a run rate b uh, basis, we don't quite understand what exactly the patterns are that a machine like that actually identifies, right? At least uh, not, um, and the, pay, uh, the point was made earlier on, um, in a systematic way, um, I think it was our colleague from the from the Swedish uh, from the Swedish Central Bank who made clear that the way we think today about this thing is we model a system according to a theory and then we test data and uh, and then we understand better understand whether our model is is r real or not. This is the way our thinking traditionally traditionally has worked and works until today in conventional ways. Machine learning turns it upside down, right? In that respect, it is a challenge for the market participants. It's also a challenge for us as a regulator supervisor. Would we be able to deploy this technology in our own work? Answer for the moment, no. We are a public authority. We need to be able, much more, even more than, uh, than market participants, to produce account accountability to the public. We need to be able to explain something. We can't just go around, use a technology, identify a certain pattern or a, or a company in the market and say, like, okay, these guys are the villains. They have a problem. We can't do that on the basis of a model that we don't even understand, mm -hmm. right? Because that doesn't work if you are the public authority. And so this is a, a thinking process where we need to get much better at. Let me just make an additional point. I think before we think of t new tools to deal uh, with, this, with the current situation, we have an additional step that maybe either comes in parallel or comes in front. W we need to make up our minds about this is how, to what extent do we need to bring new activities, new data, or new financial market activities in the context of data into the perimeter of existing law? Before we think about new, new laws, right? Mm -hmm. There is a whole body of law that governs all sorts of financial activities, right? Some people might say more than we can handle, right? And, uh, and uh, we've had the case with crypto assets uh, just half a year ago where we looked across a whole range of crypto assets and tried to understand, do they fall under the remit of existing law? Yes or no? It wasn't quite that easy, I have to say. It's certainly not straightforward. Still not easy. <laughs> and and st it, it still isn't, right? It still occupies us, and we're working closely and trying to understand what is going on. But first, that question needs to be settled. Right? in order exactly to provide a level playing field. If we, invite new f if we invent new legal frameworks for every little financial activity that comes our way, then we will end up with a totally fragmented regulatory framework. And that is, of course, another thing that maybe we don't want to have. So the question of how does the current legislative and legal framework and the requirements relate to new activities is a question we need to address as well. I guess it's a, it's a risk that we don't want to have a you know, new law for every market entrant. I mean, That's um, for sure, but on the other hand, obviously, yeah, you, you need to see, that's why I said, maybe you look more at activity than institution uh, to see. Yes. But this is a, is a, is a longer term. Huh? Yeah. So for the moment, for the moment, the business models are still quite, quite different with banks, insurance and others. So, yeah. but, but it could converge. And at that point, then you, have to, you might have to react to that, actually, yeah, in, in, in terms of legislation. But I mean, the other thing is you don't want to have an OCK legislation. And, and also you need to know, OK, what is the risk that I'm, that, that I'm actually regulating? Yeah? And that's why I've tried to show that in the presentation that this, this, this financial stability, and there are several risks coming there. There's, there's consumer protection and there's competition. Yeah? And all of this is somehow mingled together. And you, you might have different regulatory tools for the one or the other. So that makes it, I think, so complex. Yeah. Um, I think this takes us to the big tech companies, because I think they, they, have a, they have a really big role. Yeah, I mean, do you want to comment on... Yeah, just a minor yes. comment. Uh, adding to that is that uh, I agree that we, we need to have a step-by-step -step approach because we don't as understand these risks and benefits yet so well. And uh, if we excess, undertake excessive regulation and get new and new laws, this is 
having a, really a high compliance cost for s firms, especially small ones. And uh, we don't want to do that, that we kill all these small firms and uh, or prevent competition by uh, hindering the entry of the new ones because the regulatory burden is so high. I think it's, there should be a patience. If you think about automobiles, for instance, it took quite many decades. Like there was 1905, the first auto shop in Finland. And the first legislation, which was uh, uh, mandating the seat belts on the front seat was 1970s and uh, 1980s, late 1980s when there was legislation mandating the uh, back, uh, back seat belt. And it took quite many lives beyond these decades. And I think this is not really, a, okay, this can, can lead to the uh, high risks, but this is not a question of life and death here. But I think there's a difference between a small fintech and you have you might think of regulatory sandboxes and things you know, to develop. The other thing is, uh, you know, big techs coming in. Or look at Libra, for example. And once this is is operating with this vast amount of clients that they have, then it's very difficult for a regulator to come at that. So you need. I think it, it depends, and that maybe is also the kind of bridge to your to your question. Huh? So uh, I think big techs come in with you know the complete. It depends on what services they they're taking on. But that is a you know it's a different matter entirely also the regulator and you've seen the discussion that we've had on the on on, on libra um those that say you have to ban it completely to those at least you have to regulate it uh you know if you don't for example make sure that uh, at least uh, compliance uh, you know with standards and rules that we already have is ensured uh, it's very difficult once once uh, you know this thing is circulating it's there it's very difficult to come after that but so it, i think it depends and Heli, you've done a lot of research on, on these big tech companies. I, I, I suppose the culture is quite different. I mean, the businesses that they have been uh, engaged in so far have been you know, not regulated much at all, um, like search and you know, advertising and, and so on. Now they're looking at entering the market into a, one of the most regulated industries there is. Um, you know, is there a fit for their for their for their strategy for their business, like do we can we really expect the big techs to have a uh, a role in the financial industry where they're more active participants and not just vendors or enablers? Yeah, I think uh, that has been a major reason. It has been mentioned in many of the uh, books or texts that uh, why these U.S. Giants, they don't enter, for instance, the U.S. Uh, traditional banking sector is the heavy regulation. And instead, in the United States, there is a very uh, kind of low regulation for the uh, data. And therefore, they have stick into these kind of mobile wallets and so on. And the, uh, now it really seems that uh, uh, they are getting into the uh, also to the financial service business, like I said, uh, that Google is uh, entering really providing uh, the traditional banking services. And I'm not quite sure. Um, there's a lot of talk about that this is only about data, but I think it's not probably only about data. Uh, they, it's also about data because, for instance, Google has, has uh, making a lot of uh, money from the advertising. But I think they, they do know that they are very good at uh, providing customer experience. And they can really get uh, profits also from the traditional business by, by providing such services uh, that the traditional uh, banks are not able to provide yet. But I think it's good also in a sense that they enter the market because this is taking the traditional structures, traditional banks, they have to improve their performance. They have to uh, also apply new technologies, use data and so on, which they, which they have been reluctant to do. Otherwise, they get obsolete. They will be eaten by these data giants. Yeah. Any additional views? I mean, it goes back to my earlier point. When any of uh, of these companies uh, enters financial services as we know them and as we define them in our body of law, then of course they need to sign up for a license, and we will look at these things. And if they, if it is a product in that sense, then uh, they will be supervised as such. Yeah. And if not, uh, then there might be a gray area like we had it in the crypto assets where we as regulators, supervisors, policymakers need to make up our minds whether you know, something should be brought within a parameter or should be left with, uh, outside the parameter. And that's more a medium to long term thinking topic, uh, Klaus said it. Um, I think uh, it is important that all of us 
And that's also an analytical task. That's also the benefit then of data. Understand the products that, being, uh, that are being offered, the new services that are being offered, and the risks that lie behind it, and whether these products are in the end offered by an institution like a big tech firm, uh, or by anybody else, an incumbent or not, or by a small financial uh, technology firm, in the first place does not matter. We need to understand what this company does, what the pro pro uh, product is, and what the risks are behind it, and then we can handle it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that there's not, I mean, the regulation is such, okay, we have competition for that, but in general, uh, it should be technology neutral. Huh? But it's, of course, if you enter, you know, a certain market, if you a service market that is regulated, you will have to <laughs> abide by the regulation that is there. And, and that I want to see, because that's obviously is, is, is a lot of uh, you know, experience, uh, you know, in, in terms of risk and all the rest, and regulation that will apply. So I'm interested to see how, the, how it works in the, in the U.S., huh? Because one thing is uh, the interface with the data, and uh, another thing is really, and or, or to try, I mean, cryptocurrency is one thing, um, but then go really into traditional banking service, uh, interesting to see. Yeah. I think we could see if we have any questions from the audience at this point. We seem to have oh, quite yes, many. Uh, many. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we start in this end. Oh, thank you very much, very interesting. Uh, so apart from the tools and the insights that central banks and policy or public authorities should have, what should be the attitude? Um, should they be embracing this new innovation because it's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to tackle very important issues like financial inclusion for the developing world or anti-money laundering? Or on the other side, they should be even more conservative because we have heard yesterday the, the issue of the unknown and on, unknown and unknowns, and we know that by definition, all these techniques are relying on traditional patterns in the financial system. But precisely, the actions of the regulators and of central banks is to is, the aim is to change the financial system. So, by definition, the risk of unknown unknowns is even bigger, bigger in financial markets because that's precisely the, the, the purpose of of public authorities' work. So, should we be more even co more conservative or less conservative in terms of attitude? To towards these new developments. Mm -hmm. uh, from my point of view, I mean, obviously, it's, I think we need to embrace the new technology. There's no point in saying, no, no, we don't want it. We want it, and it's important, and it will come anyway, and it will, you know, it will improve the service. So I think that's the first, at least from you know, Commission's point of view. Uh, what obviously ne you need to be careful about is how you need to manage this transition somehow. What's going to happen? Make sure that uh, you know the, the services overall uh, are offered in a competitive manner. I think that's one thing you do, and you obviously want to make sure, as we discussed, that uh, overall the the system remains stable. But uh, it's more like um, trying to accompany the process. I think it would be the wrong way to say no. You, you, we don't do it. We regulate it out. That would not be our approach. I think I think it's a, the answer to your question is a clear yes, both. Right, uh, we we need to embrace and support technologies that can improve, you know, societies and and, and consumer uh, experience and usage and reduce prices and so on, and at the same time remain vigilant. One more point in this in this regard, um, I think, um, when it comes to the unknown unknowns, we need to be aware that we've always had unknown unknowns. So this is nothing new, right? Um, and uh, and in particular. I think we need to be aware that when it comes, for example, to computer-driven, um, machine learning-driven investment decisions, uh, of course, um, yes, it is e enigmatic. We need to understand especially the black box, so the uh, AI, so the non-X AI sort of outfits, um, definitely so, in order to understand the complexity that is being generated. At the same time, we should not fool ourselves until today when you look at conventional investment decisions, it's not like the you know, that we really know how investment decisions are being made, right? There is a lot of metaphysics around these things as well. So um, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's really a, 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 a matter of scale that we're looking at, where we simply need to improve and be at the cutting edge of, of understanding uh, how the system evolves. Yeah, I think I agree that uh, promoting entry is as very important and promoting innovation, innovating entry and fintechs. This is the way these uh, markets and sectors are developing. 
Sometimes the old technologies get obsolete, sometimes the old firms get obsolete, and they are replaced by the more efficient ones, which can provide customers better service, and in term, like now in terms of financial services, it's more often quicker access, quicker service, and so on. It's better quality. So I would go for it. So uh, I, I wanted to pose a question. I, I really liked uh, Haley's uh, discussion of the acquisitions by, uh, by, by big tech companies. So CB Insights has talked about Silicon Valley Pac-Man. Mm. So they're gobbling up the mm. various. Um, so my question is, do you, see, do you think that the competition authorities, particularly in the US, this would be the FTC, um, should take more actions to, uh, to prevent these kind of acquisitions? And if they should, um, you know, uh, how do you, as a you know, a, a citizen of, of a different country, who's uh, of course affected by that decisions, but not uh, directly part of the constituency they report to, how do you make that view known? And do you think there is an accountability or governance problem with national competition policy, but international spillovers of those uh, those decisions? Well, I think, uh, my, in my opinion, well, they don't only buy companies in the United States. They buy them all over the world, also in Finland and Europe. So it's not only the question of the US, but uh, thinking about the authorities, how to say, they should think about it is like, uh, I think not to act hastily in a sense that, okay, they can't, because they're big ones, they can't buy these small ones. We need more research to understand the underlying motives and what are the consequences? Are they really killing innovation of these uh, small startups, or are they exploiting it better than the uh, the small companies and bringing more welf welfare? Well, if if these are killer acquisitions, so they just kill them because they want to avoid competition, I, I think we should uh, change the antitrust rules such that it does not. We don't look at only the large mergers, but in case of these uh, big platforms or big, uh, gigantic technology companies, the rules would be a bit different depending on the size of the company acquiring, not only on the size of the, the combined company. We, do we have some questions over there also? Who do? Thank you. <clears throat> uh, Perto Korhonen from the Qatar Financial Center Regulatory Authority. Thank you very much. Um, I have a blunt um, question. Um, I was in 2006, um, Alan Greenspan retired from the Fed. I was at the same time, I was a starting regulator and a central banker. There was a wide interview of Greenspan on the FT and he was saying that the biggest secret of central banks is that they're actually working on the same data everyone else is. So the daddy doesn't actually know any more than the kids. And um, I think with these developments, we might have gotten to a place where this gap actually has widened, so that we actually know less than the others, i.e. the markets. And um, earlier today we saw that um, the first step in creating change is to create the sense of urgency. And I think I'm still waiting to see a bit of more bit more of sense of urgency from us in how are we going to close the gap in the coming years or keep the secret if that's possible. Do any of the panelists want to? Um, you mean the gap that uh, uh, regulators, supervisors, central banks have vis-a-vis -vis the private sector, correct? Mm, I said it earlier on. I mean, we've always had this gap, right? Um, uh, that lies in the nature of, uh, of a free market economy, right? The state has a certain position and can uh, see and supervise and control only so much. So this is a, this is a long-standing fact. But I agree with you to the extent that in order to be a credible public authority. And credibility is, of course, something that central bankers care a lot about, that we as regulators, supervisors care a lot about. Um, in order to have credibility, you need to be able to show that residual capacity, at least, that just in case you have the power to go in and stop the show, a situation, and manage a situation. Um, and that is what we have in terms of policy instruments, of course. 
in many respects. Uh, and a second part of that is, of course, uh, being able to prove at any moment in time that in terms of the capacity of dealing with data, in terms of the capacity of handling complex um, codes and complex algorithms and understanding what is going on, we as regulators, supervisors, and I guess the same goes for central banks, even though I can't speak for them, we have the commitment at any moment in time to precisely do that and prove that. And we have this, these capacities. We develop them as, w as we go. And, uh, and we're trying to be there at the cutting edge of what uh, the technology in the financial market is and to understand them and to work with them. And basically, like I said, we are all already ourselves applying many of the methods that market participants apply, of course, adjusted to the needs that we have, right? Um, we don't have the same operation as an Amazon, of course, as, as a regulator supervisor. We are much more limited, we are much more focused, and our data has a specific use, but we do that. Um, and there's always, it's, uh, over time, it's always a, a matter of, of striking the balance, and me as a uh, data officer, of course, I would say, yeah, the more the better, give me more money, but, um, but, that, is, uh, but that is an ongoing calibration process. I mean, from the Commission's point of view, we don't have access to individual data anyway. This is the supervisors. No, we do the high-level legislation. So what we look is rather, okay, we try to be informed by the supervisors, but it doesn't mean that we have no data we, that we cannot regulate. The risk is rather that we regulate too quickly too much because you can regulate that if you want. <laughs> so, to, uh, that, so that's, it's not a question is, I mean, you, you need to get a, a grasp of, of the overall landscape changing. I don't think we need all the individual data. It's more, you know, the broader picture. There's more questions. Uh, let's go there. I have a question for Olivier, if that's all right. I was quite surprised by your remarks uh, regarding the potential need for the European cloud. And I was also surprised by the recent remarks by the ECB uh, expressing support uh, potentially for the need for European-based payment providers as opposed to Visa, MasterCard, etc. Um, is this a beginning of some sort of, are, are these two related or is this a beginning of some sort of an, you know, industrial policy, if you will, when it comes to financial services and data? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, I think as I said, this is a broader, this is a broader issue because and it's true that um, uh, I think we realize, or some politicians realize that, you know, somehow the world is changing, no? So we have the US, we have China, we've always said, yeah, yeah, we're very open, open trade, we rely on each other. And then suddenly you see that, um, you know, some, some of the big powers actually, um, they don't really engage as they did in the past, no? Multilaterally. And the question is, how do you react to that? <laughs> and what on top of this obviously is, and you see that in uh, a number of uh, instances that, um, Currency becomes a foreign policy, policy tool. That was not the case before, at least not to that extent. Um, and we saw that in Iran very clearly is that if Europeans, we don't agree, okay, we can try to do something, but it doesn't lead us uh, very far. So there's a sense of being, um, you know, with all these extraterritorial mm, sanctions that we see uh, in a situation where we're in, you know, a difficult spot. And, and this is uh, generally the question of, I would say, uh, financial ec economic autonomy. Uh, and it's more general. It's financial services is more general. The question about infrastructure. Do we need or oh, it's important to us that we own the infrastructure? But you have the same debate on telecoms. You will have it in financial services everywhere. So the question is, and now we, I think we're waking up a bit and say, okay, well, the others are far more advanced. Is that an issue or not? Or do we want to have a European industrial policy? So in that sense, you're right. This is, uh, but I think we're aware, and there are different different views, obviously, uh, around the table. But the, uh, you know, you get this this, this feeling that um, there are basically these three blocks. Huh? There's, there's Asia, China, U.S., and us. And what do we do? You know, in, in terms of foreign policy, in terms of infrastructure, are, are we? Uh, do we care about our autonomy? And and you're right. This also goes into payments. Huh? The, you know, you know, Visa, Master, the all American payment systems. Is that an issue or not? What about data, the clouds? 
Um, I mean, we have, for example, the question of the instant payments. Do we want a European payment system? Do we want something that, you know, the next generation of payment systems that uh, the ECB has started to develop already? Um, what we, what do we want to have that? So there's the whole debate that's, you're right, that's, uh, that's going on at the moment. Okay. One, One more question. One more question. Thanks, it's been a really interesting panel. Um, my question is quite a short one. It's just really, do you think central banks, financial regulators, their remits and tools are flexible enough to deal with this new world? So a kind of big theme I'm getting here is that finance for years and for decades, for centuries, has been quite shielded in terms of structure, the boundary structure of um, the market. But it's now becoming much more of a kind of con conglomerate surrendering it. Now, other industries and sectors have had to deal with this for years and decades, but maybe financial regulation is tailored for a very structured, rigid market, and just how flexible are remits um, to adapt to this changing world? Yeah, I think uh, I mentioned at the beginning of the slide is, is that um, you're right. So the, we, we, the regulation is basically by institution. I look, um, so we've not at all thought about <coughs> big tax and that the big tax and that dimension coming into the market. This is really a, a game changer. Now, the only question is, uh, how do we react to that? I think it's a bit too early to say that. But uh, if really the idea is that we we're going into, you know, platforms that that will uh, that will offer you from banking, insurance, or whatever services, all the rest, um, then I think we we actually need to move away from that and, and regulate the activity and, and the business and regulate you know the big techs the same way as we do traditional ones. So that's I think the um, but we'll see. Uh, we're not we're not there yet. All right. Maybe as a final question for the for each of the panelists um, to kind of wrap this up. Um, so, what is the one topic that we haven't talked about in the last two days that we should have talked about that maybe is a topic for our next conference? <laughs> That's a tough I one. I was here yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> no, was I. What's the one thing we haven't talked about enough? <laughs> maybe Helly, you can start. Well, I would go to the. Uh, well, this is just my preference. And I think it might be not the, uh, the preference of all the audience, but I would go more detailed to the uh, regulation of the data different, in different types of environment and in different types of markets. But that's, that's just what, what I would need more discussion about. Yeah. Steffen? In essence, I, I would actually agree with that. I mean, it's, um, uh, I, I think one key question that we need to ask for ourselves is, what role does information play in a society at large and, of course, in, in, uh, in, in financial markets? What are the property rights? What are the intellectual property rights? Um, how are they being measured and how can they be shared? How can they be open sourced? Uh, and how can they be, how, how, to what extent do companies have a fiduciary duty to administer them and the systems within which they're being processed? Um, we have bits and pieces all over the place already in the regulatory frameworks. Um, but we, I think, uh, given the swiftness and the scale of this data world coming to us, it is definitely a good point in time thinking about how can we can be, as societies, can, how can we be consistent about it and good about managing these data, especially in a political, envi political environment that is getting increasingly fragmented. You just had it in your last answer. There is uh, ac around the globe, <clears throat> you know, m more, f more political fragmentation going on, less will to cooperate in many areas of the world. Uh, and, uh, and, and that in a situation where data is a global phenomenon. We need that international global dialogue on in pretty much understanding and agreeing on how we want to deal uh, with information about individuals, about companies. Uh, and that is a big challenge. Yeah, yeah linked to that, I mean, the question is, is uh, global standards. Can we have global standards? What do they look like? Um, at the moment, we don't have them. And with this, as you said, with the fragmentation, it's getting more difficult. But ideally, you would be able to um, uh, develop global standards on most of these issues. Huh? So competition, financial stability, cyber security, uh, that would be a nice subject. All right, regulation of data, standards of data, yeah. So <coughs> please uh, join me in thanking the, the panel for the excellent discussion and their presentations. It's been a lovely afternoon.
And thank you, Alexi, for moderating this. So thanks again, uh, all the panelists and Alexi, for this last session. Um, since this is the final session, it's now time to wrap up this conference. Uh, first, I would like to say thank you to all our distinguished speakers. Um, it's been really interesting talks. And uh, also to the audience, uh, we have had good questions and discussions, and also to the audience online. Um, of course, uh, I, I'm so happy also that so many of you joined us all here today. Uh, and uh, I hope that you watch out for the next coming conferences uh, in this series. We've seen a lot and heard a lot during these two days. Many speakers showed a lot of excitement about uh, potential in these technologies. Bruno Tissot gave us a thoughtful overview of the new opportunities and challenges that artificial intelligence and big data present to financial stability. Louis Marc Ducharme continue in showing that these technologies hold great potential for official users. And Matthew Blake pointed out how this excitement is propelling firms to create totally new products and services. John Frost and Robert McRae reminded us that we should strive to understand how these technologies are changing the structure and functioning of financial markets. Because it seems that while these technologies are helping at making finance more efficient, they are at the same time forming new risk throughout unexpected consequences. Thomas Beltanen voiced his concern to us that there is still a lot of work to be done in order to fully understand the complex impact of technology and called for more cooperation in order to make real progress. We are probably only uh, scratching the surface in what can be done with these technologies. Presentations by John William Ophoff and Vadim Sobolevsky Edgar May and Marcus Stiblin suggest that alternative data, new methods of data collection and even more innovative uses of advanced analytics can further expand our ability to analyze and understand the financial markets. However, these are not called advanced technologies for nothing. A recurring theme in almost every presentation was that solutions require a very high level of analytical maturity from organizations and may require a more fundamental rethinking of how work is being performed. The importance of preparing for this leap forward is of utmost importance. Klaus Wiedner, Stefan Kern and Heli Koski discussed how these innovations may also uh, contain features that may increase vulnerabilities in extreme events in financial markets. And policymakers need also to be aware of all these potential issues. Because it's not evident whether a more data-driven financial ecosystem will be more efficient and stable, the rise of big tech companies may further complicate this. The positive thing is, however, that there is a lot of discussion going on about these issues. Like Mary Hataya pointed out, the ethics and regulation of AI is particularly relevant for the moment, and clear progress is being made. Good regulation is a public good that can be used to foster innovation and competition, but we must not get complacent. We need to monitor that regulation, uh, uh, that regulation achieves its intended objectives. Ginger Jin reminded us about the importance of getting regulation right. Regulation may also benefit from innovative thinking. We might be compelled to also try new ways of enhancing trust in the financial system. For example, by promoting open data and open source code initiatives like Jacopo Grazzini suggested. To, to conclude, I think that we all agree that we should not stop here. We must keep on working because we still don't have all the answers and, we not, and we've only seen the first few steps of what the future might contain for us all. We must keep this dialogue going on because these topics will become very relevant in the next years as finance will become more and more data-driven. It is important that we all talk, share ideas and views about regulation and financial stability. I press all parties to get together and further develop these great discussions that we've had here yesterday and today. Thank you all for making this conference such a success. You can find the recording of this event on the YouTube channel of Bank of Finland. And I would also like to inform that 
keep an eye up for upcoming events in this matter. Uh, the topic is, as we see, not growing away, but uh, becoming bigger and bigger. And they can also be combined uh, conferences with academia to, to show the latest, uh, uh, latest edge in this matter. But for now, I would thank you for attending this conference once again. And I would like to thank not only the speakers, but also Bank of Finland, who have such successfully coordinated and, and uh, arrange this conference and um, I hope really that you have a safe journey and uh, if you're lucky, yes you are, you're going to see some of the Finnish beautiful winter sun still. Uh, during the lunch that is served, uh, we now just finish off with the lunch and please stay for mingle and talk and whenever you feel you're finished and need to leave, you're of course free to leave. Have a great day and a safe journey back. <laughs>